factors. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunday Sunset Safari, a quiet contemplation of the week that was and the week that is to come. We have some starlings there, a mixed flock of greater blue-eared and cape glossies. My name is James Hendry. I'm waiting for the strap. Has I been strapped, do you think? Do you think I've been strapped yet? Ah, good. And uh, on camera today, Senzom Kiza, who is wearing a shirt, the magnificence of which I can barely describe to you. It has a lion underneath an acacia tortillas tree on it, and it is in the manner of, uh, well, what I suppose we'd call here a Mandela shirt, wouldn't you, Senzom? Is that, is that correct, the style? It even has tassels underneath it. It really is a thing of um, haute couture. I think that's the correct term. We also have David Gitu joining us on this vehicle. On the other car, we have got Stivovo. I think he's heading towards Tandy, being filmed by uh, Sebastian. And on foot today, we have got Ralph Kirsten. No gaiters for him today. It was very tough to actually make him go out. He's convinced he's going to be savaged by ticks. He's probably correct. And he's being filmed by David Eastor. The other David. So many Davids around the place at the moment. My plan is probably to go down towards Chitra Dam and see if we can't find the Avoca males that were around there today, as explained to me by David Gitu, who has now learnt where Chitra Dam is, which is a good start, I'd say, after just a few days here. OK, let's have one last look at the birds. The reason I stopped at these birds is that they tend, at this time of the year, as we go into the winter, to start to flock for some reason. I'm not really sure why. Nobody really knows why, I don't think. Uh, but in the winter time, they tend to flock much more than they do in the summer, probably because they're not breeding, and so they are not particularly competitive over mates or territory. So I think that's what's going on there. All righty, we're going to make our gentle way down towards Chitra Dam on the Sunday afternoon. A bit blustery, apparently around about 27 degrees. I don't think it's quite that hot. It's 71. Or, uh, is it 71? Was it 70? I think that's what he said. 75 odd, actually, uh, Celsius uh, Fahrenheit. Right, before I waffle myself into a hole, let's go across to uh, Mr. Ralph Kirsten on his large, ungated feet. Well, thank you, James, and I tell you what, yeah, I'm not going to be getting bitten by any uh, ticks today. Welcome aboard on the uh, afternoon bushwalk. I say welcome aboard, but uh, we're out on foot, and what a wonderful day it is this afternoon. A little bit blustery, as James has said a little bit earlier, but it's quite warm. It's definitely not cold. Now, my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera we've got Darby. How's it, Davi? Uh, please don't forget to join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Send us your questions and your comments and get involved on this reality bushwalk. Now, the first thing I wanted to do was um, obviously get up a termite mound because that's the best thing to do when you're out in the bush. Get a little bit of height, scan the area, see what's around. Get your ears out, get your senses working, let your eyes feel for any movement. And um, the first little bit of movement that I spotted was one on one of my favorite trees out here in the field. And it was actually in this little hole that um, uh, there were a couple of squirrels that I think have made their home in here. Now, they were uh, having a family tiff and some of them scuttled off into the grass and I think there might be one or two of them down there at the moment but what a wonderful tree this is have a look at it it is so characteristic and this bark of the leadwood or the combretum imberb and um, the leadwood being uh, uh, very indicative of how heavy the wood and dense the wood is and these trees can live for hundreds if not thousands of years and once they die they remain as such for uh, pretty much the same as long as uh, as long as they've lived so hundreds if not thousands of years so squirrels and vultures and lizards and all sorts of animals will use this as their home and so for me one of the special um, characters that we do have out here it's not all about the spotted cats and the lions and the hyenas uh, we've got to look a little bit closer at some of the the big characters that have they've been through it all they've seen world wars come and go they've seen people 
people come and go. They've seen different animals move in and out. And, well, elephants, they're not going to be pushing this guy over. And so I think I really like the leadwood. Now, I think we're going to see what small little things we're going to be finding today. I'll always be happy if I can find some hyena tracks and we'll try and follow up and see if we can find that elusive hyena den. But um, let's see what we can find. In the meantime, off to, off to Steve. I think he wants to say hello. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing this afternoon? My name is Steve Falkenbridge, and I'm joined on camera by the impeccable Sebastian. And we are out on drive. And guess what we are going to do? We are on our way to where Tandy was this morning. I have not seen her or Talamba in a very long time. So apparently, Ralph said, Hyena Ralph said, there's a little bit of meat left on the steam box this morning. So hopefully. When we get there, we're going to see her. So we're very excited. Please don't forget to send through your questions. Hashtag Safari Love or follow us on the YouTube stream. Either one will do. Ooh, okay. I wasn't expecting to see that. But this is clearly where the evoker males came through last night. Let me just move over. Can you get it just there, Sebi? Okay, we just saw a track. Just going to jump out real quick. Can you see that? Okay, so we had them right up in the north last night on the show, right up of Buffalsook Dam. They probably came walking straight down sort of this western sort of side and all the way straight through. As I mentioned this morning when we were looking for all sorts of tracks, just below, behind us is the Mawati where uh, this other tributary drains it, very dry, dry riverbeds at the moment, and it's the highway in Druma at the moment. All the cats are moving through. So I'm on a Batelier Road. I thought I'd just come up here on our way to Tandi, and I don't think anyone drove here this morning because they would have seen these cats, but all these tracks. But needless to say, they were found this morning anyway, and you got to see them, which is marvelous. But we are going to continue on. Sorry for that quick stop. Beautiful big male lion track. And there's more in the roads. Yes, definitely the three boys that came down south. Mm. Ali, very good question. The Birmingham boys seem to be dominating the entire Sabi Sands at the moment without any competition. We're right up in the northern Sabi Sands, and so the Evokers seem to be carving out this piece of territory. So I don't think anything will become of the Evokers if, I mean, of the Birmingham's, if the Evokers establish here, they just might sort of push the Birmingham's down a bit. They've got plenty of space to maneuver in. They're being a little bit greedy, to be honest. They're taking up as many lion prides as they can, as much territory as they can, which is unsustainable. I mean, if you look at the Roman army back in the day, it uh, eventually it, it lost because it was too spread out. You know, it's very difficult to defend a frontier that is enormous, that encompasses the entire Europe and East Asia and North Africa without some expense. So the four males need to patrol regularly. If they can't patrol, they're going to lose out those territories because Territory holders need to be active in those areas. And I mean, we don't see the Birmingham's often enough for me to think that they could hold on to this. But obviously something happened in the south. The males moved out. I don't really know the dynamics too well. Oh, look at that. There's a cuckoo. Looks like a Lavalin's cuckoo, I think. Just over my shoulder here. A little bit of a late bloomer. You see the stripes on the chin, on the chest. The beautiful crest, that long black tail. There we go. The Valens Cuckoo, they like to parasitize on the Aramark Babblers, I think. Aramark Babblers. He's still over here. And he's obviously a late fledging, fledgling, and I doubt he's going to migrate back north with the rest of the cuckoos that have already left. So he might be stranded here and over winter. And I wonder if he's going to enjoy a diet of something other than caterpillars, which is what the cuckoos enjoy. Okay, well, we're going to continue on. Uh, as I said, heading into the area of Tandy from this morning. And uh, in the meantime, let's go to Mr. James Hendry and see how he's doing. Oh, I'm doing fine. I am doing as I was doing before I saw you last. I'm looking for animals. That is what one does on a game drive. And enjoying the general atmosphere of the autumn. 
There is a, there are two interesting birds here. The first one, however, is the most colourful, and that is the orange-breasted bushrike calling from this gardenia bush over here. <coughs> it's now desisted, obviously. There it is. Okay, since it's gone into the edge of that Cumbretum bush there. You see it there? You see it at all? No, um, it's to the right, left of that. Left? Left, yeah, that bush. Right in there. The green bush. No, I think that's about right where it was, but it's obviously gone now. Can you see the oriole perched upon the tall tree beyond? Let me go back a little. What a hope, hopeless effort from me. No, the oriole's still there. It will now fly away as we focus on it. Yeah, very nice. Bright yellow, juxtaposed with the bluish hue behind it. And that is the black-headed oriole. Slightly less fancied cousin than the European golden oriole and the most beautiful oriole, which is the African golden oriole. The African golden is basically just a flying blob of gold. James, you say that's very beautiful, and obviously that's not me, that is somebody watching the show called James, beautifully named person you are. You say it is very beautiful. It's, they're certainly one of my favourites, and I think they've got the most lovely call, too. They've got a horrible alarm call, and goes, wah, wah. but they've got this gorgeous liquid kind of, um, sounds like molten liquid being dropped. I'll play it for you if you like. Would you like that, Senzo? I thought you might. That's why I suggested it. Here we go. Isn't that lovely? Oof. Beautiful. Whistling liquid call. And just now, I'm sure it's going to give us the alarm call, which is very un unpleasant. Hmm. Well, this bird is an insect eater. You can see that from his beak. And he's not a shrike. And, Lily, there are probably about... Oh, I'll tell you. Shall we go through the list of the shrikes together, Lily? You can then count them. We've got the lesser grey shrike and the red bat shrike and the white crown shrike and the grey-headed bush shrike, the orange-breasted bush shrike, the magpie shrike, the Retz's helmet shrike, I suppose that could be a shrike, the white-crested helmet shrike, so that's eight, then we also have the two chagra species. They're both shrikes, so the black crown chagra and the brown crown chagra. That's ten. You know, I'm going to have to start using my toe now. Um, I think we may have run out of shrikes, which is a good thing, because I've run out of fingers. Shall we say ten shrikes? I'm going to ask David to give me the book, just so that I can make sure. He seems to be sitting on my book, David. This book is very old, okay? If it, it has survived many, many years. And if it doesn't survive this game drive because you've been sat on it, I shall be deeply upset. <laughs> Let that be a stern warning to you. Uh, Lily, one second. Lily, one second. Here we go. Okay. Let's see if I was right. Grey-headed bullshrike we have there. You got them there, Senzel? Uh, so we've got, only got one of those, and we've got two of the helmet shrikes, so that's two. We have the orange-breasted bushrike, so that's, sorry, that's four. Then we have the two chagras, so that's five and six. 
Then we have all the boo-boo shrikes. I forgot about them. Southern boo-boo. So that's seven. The fiscal, we can find that here sometimes. So that's eight. The brew-brew, I forgot about him too. That's nine. The puffback, I forgot about him too. That's ten. Magpie shrike, we said, eleven. Redback shrike, twelve. White crown shrike, thirteen. Lesser grey shrike, fourteen. Fourteen shrikes. Lily, that's a lot of shrikes, really, isn't it? Good. Very nice question. Thank you for that. I'm just going to go and have a little look around the treehouse waterhole because Steve said he had tracks of a leopard around there yesterday. And uh, so let's go and find out what Ralph is finding on his own two feet. <laughs> Well, everyone, I've just come to this area. It's sort of around the area of Rebecca's Road, Zoe's Road, because um, I've been intrigued. There's, a, there's this um, silver cluster leaf forest here, and it, it's always nice and cool in this area as well because of how many trees there are in this area. And um, I'm pretty sure it's down to there being a lot of mineral salts in this particular zone because they, they like to grow on that. And the silver cluster leaf I'm talking about are these trees here. I know there's been a lot said about them but this particular area here is where there is a lot of them and it in fact is like a forest of silver cluster leaves and as I was saying a lot of mineral salts in the soil and that's normally down to there being um, a, a seep line so where the water is coming out and, and dispersing here in this particular area resulting in evaporation and leaving behind all those mineral salts so very impressive and I just thought we'd come through and have a look um, this one in front of us seems like it's starting to seed it's got those nice sort of pink looking seeds on it and a lot of the locals, they actually, along with the purple pod cluster leaf or the low felt cluster leaf, they actually make a very nice tea out of it. Now, remember the other day we were watching the uh, impala actually feeding on these leaves, which is very strange because uh, it makes your mouth very dry. But um, like we were, uh, I was saying with Darby when we were out there, I was thinking maybe they're trying to, uh, you know, solidify their stomach a little bit if they've got a bit of uh, a loose uh, bowel. Um, so that's what I was thinking. But I haven't uh, spoken to anybody that knows any reason why the Impala were doing that. They must know something we don't. But I think that it's definitely down to something like that. Now, we always come through and have a look and just see if there's any anything interesting about a particular tree. Now, uh, Jason, the tallest trees here uh, in the Juma concession itself, or in our traverse, are probably things like the jackalberries, um, some of the nyala trees. Uh, but I would say uh, jackalberry probably being you know next to the river Rhine uh, areas, they're probably one of the bigger ones, and that's where we do get a lot of the biggest trees. We do have some nice big marulas. There's, um, there's not too many baobabs. They, they seem to be a bit more north up in the Kruger Park itself. But um, here along this particular area, uh, I would say definitely jackalberry, some nyala trees as well, um, and, and maybe some of the marulas, the false marulas too. And as we go past there, there's another uh, a weeping wattle. And do you know why it's called a weeping wattle, anybody? I'd like to know if anybody knows why it's called a weeping wattle. There's three trees that we call rain trees. One of them is the African weeping wattle. Another one being the apple leaf. The apple leaf with those very big leaves. I will show you one. And the other one being the bourbine, the um, Scotia uh, species. And they've all got particular reasons why they are called rain trees. And uh, this this uh, weeping wattle down to um, a lot of the uh, flowers and things that drop off the nectar as well as the scotia tree. Also, um, when they're flowering, extreme nectar that drops off. But there's something very important about these trees, why they're really called a, the rain tree, is because they get um, a spittle bug, which the larva lives on the branch, and they encase themselves with a lot of, it's like spittle. They make a foam around themselves to stop them from drying out. It's not the right time of year for that, but um, they make so much of this foam that they, it drips off of the tree itself. So if you walk underneath, 
underneath, it can feel like it's raining. So those three trees being the rain trees. Steph, good answer there also. Thank you for uh, joining us on, on, the, on the walk, um, saying that the leaves turn down uh, when, when there's rain or rain on the way. And obviously when they do turn down like that, then it also collects a lot of rain and um, starts to pour off of those um, the, the leaflets. So compound leaves, very interesting. The three rain trees, remember those, the burbin, the African weeping wattle, and the apple leaf. That's uh, very interesting about those three trees. So, we're on the road here that we're just jumping onto now. We're going to see if we can pick up on any hyena tracks and what else is around. Okay, while we head off and try and get some tracks, I'm also going to get back into this silver cluster leaf forest. It seems James got a very big animal to show you. Off to him. Well, here is a small herd of elephants, just three of them, as you can see. You can probably count to three. And an unusually sort of small herd, and unusually led by a youngish cow. And I find it always very interesting when there's a small herd like this to figure out why. Why there are so few of them. This is, this is magic, people. To have them this close to us is absolute magic and not reacting in a negative way at all, being very kind about being with us. Thank you. Don't, don't do anything silly there. You just stay right where you are, lovely elephant. Let me take a legal photograph of you, throwing sand on yourself. No, coming right past. Oh, she's got a nasty gash in her tusk there. Isn't that fantastic? This is just brilliant. So I wouldn't say she's much more than maybe 20 years old. And I think she's pregnant again. Jamie, you say this is amazing. It is. And you know, some of the most profound experiences I've ever had out here have been with elephants like that. She's just watching us still. Now she's just giving a little bit of a head shake, so I'm not going to move. She's just kind of saying, stay where you are, let me get away a bit. Protecting her two... I can't both be her calves, I don't think. The smaller one definitely is. Now suddenly she's reacting in a manner that is fairly unpleasant. Well, not unpleasant. She just lifted her head and she's showing alarm. We'll try and show her to you. And I wonder if it isn't because the wind may be switched and she got wind of smell of us. But the wind is coming from the southeast, so it's coming from behind her. I don't think that's the reason. I think it was because she saw Senzel's shirt and she actually wanted it. Alicia, the only thing that triggered that reaction from that elephant is the same thing that triggers aggression in any other animal, and that's fear. There is n almost nothing else that will trigger an aggressive response from an animal other than fear. And so she is feeling threatened by us. She is feeling that maybe her little calf is threatened by our presence. And so she reacted by doing that. David, why are you trying to contort yourself into a small... <laughs> Kathy, you're wondering if this is a cow and two kids. I'm looking at them thinking that the older youngster, if you know what I mean, is possibly a little bit too old to be her calf. You see, I'd put that one at about 10. If she's 20, it's possible. She might be a bit more than 20. What's quite telling, though, is that the older calf has got very similarly shaped tusks to the 
my young matriarch. And I wonder if that doesn't say something about a genetic connection between them. So it's quite possible that they're both her calves. The tusks of the younger one dead straight like that cow's. Got a bit of a wound on her backside. You see about the tail there? She's also got the same kind of thing behind her ears. Now oh, that's either a skin disease or she's been spiked in the bum by, I can only think a tusk. I'm always fascinated by small herds like this because I don't really understand how they form. She would have left a much bigger herd. Or maybe her herd has kind of died around her, you know. She ended up as the oldest female in a small herd as the rest of the older females stopped giving birth and died off. Now you saw her moving her trunk around there extending it towards us and in fact all three of them did that and yes Becca they are absolutely trying to smell you when they're doing that that is the beginning of the nose for them I'm just going to give them a little bit of distance I don't want to give them a big fright so nice to spend a bit of time with elephants I'm looking at her now thinking she's not maybe as young as I thought she was. I think she's probably about 25, so that other one, almost certainly her calf as well. Now, I think that uh, the older calf is a female. I'm not sure about that younger one. And Alicia, the older one, if she is a female, which I think she is, will stay with her mother, uh, probably for most of her mother's life. And if the younger one is a little bull, he will move away eventually as he gets older. But he'll stay within this herd and with his sibling until he's probably about 14 or 15. Ah, but right, I'm going to see if I can get into a different position and Steve Ovo has had some success. Yes, we have and we have found Tundi and she's back up in the tree with apparently a Steenbock kill. I can't really see too much of it, but there is no sign of Columba. I think she's going to make me wait a little bit longer before revealing herself. The little bundle of joy was her old name. Now she's officially been named Tlalamba, the playful one. And Tandi is very relaxed. You might hear the sound of a vehicle. We have just been joined by one of the landowners from Buffelsuk. The typical leopard pose. Isn't that marvelous? So I'm going to put a little quiz out there to all of you wonderful viewers. Um, you know I enjoy my trees, so I wonder who can tell me what tree Tandi is in. I wonder if you can tell me what tree she is in at the moment with her carcass. Hashtag Safari Live. And she's being shy. She's not showing her face at the moment. Mm, I'm super stoked. Seb is stoked as well. We haven't seen her. I can't remember the last time I saw her. I have seen her since I've been back from Kenya, but I haven't seen Columba yet. Only on the screen, but that's not the same thing. I need to see her jumping around in the grass. And Apparently Ralph said she kept um, bringing the carcass down the tree for Columba to feed on. And then hyenas would come and then she'd take it back up. And then she'd take it down and then back up and down because Columba was finding it difficult to eat it while suspended in the tree. Raphael, no, he's not a tamarind tree. I don't think we get tamarind trees here. And it's not a leopard tree either, folks, if you're going to guess that. It's a very common tree. If you've been watching my drives, you'll know we have spoken about it on many occasions. There's the leaves. 
Mm, Lynn, you are correct, but I'm going to let a few more viewers get the answers in. Lynn is 100% correct with her answer. It's a tree that we find so many times with animals shading underneath. Alan, no, it is not a marula tree. Very fine leaves. Very, very, very fine leaves. Lots and lots of shade. Uh, we've had uh, the young Tamba up it with his kudu kill. His kudu fetus kill, should I say. We've had Hosanna many times underneath them and in, in them. Uh, we've had the Unkuhuma pride with the kudu kill underneath one. See those pods? Mm, Dale and Paul, it is not an acacia. It has no thorns, but it does look like an acacia. Lynn so far has got it correct. Isn't that just the most marvelous light? We just need Tundi to turn her face a little bit towards us so we can get so you can get some marvelous screen shots. Molly, it is indeed the toilet paper bush, the poor man's toilet paper, bear in mind. Not the rich man's toilet paper. So Molly and Lynn, well done. The toilet paper tree, the African weeping wattle. And it is a very important tree out here for, for shade. Um, it is browsed upon. The pods will give you a bad tummy if you eat them. And uh, the shade element that it brings, I mean, just in the time I've been here since January, how many times have I seen not only a leopard in them with a kill, but shading underneath them as well as lions. So very, very important tree. Definitely giving me a, a new outlook on, on these trees. And I'll never look at them the same. Whenever I see one, I'm always looking for the elusive spotted cat is perched in the branches. Oscar, yes, Tundi knows me. I'm, I'm the newest member of the team, but I spent a lot of time with her in January, especially when um, Salambo was very young. You know, it was about three months or so. We were very, very close to, to camp. We got to see her two, three minutes out of camp. She was there, and we got to see her almost every day. So, very, very spoiled. Ooh, I just got a whiff of the steenbok. The wind had just changed. It smells lovely. So, Tandy is a very relaxed cat. Every now and again, she can be quite moody. But, I mean, that's just part of her personality. And we've had some wonderful sightings with her. And I'm hoping in the next little while, I'm sure she's going to make us earn it, though. A little Tlalumba will come out of the woodwork in proper proper form because the way she's positioned with this afternoon light if the lumber goes up that tree it's going to be gorgeous Aiden seven years old she climbs up there she's got very very sharp claws and she is a cat she's just a very big one and they are very very good at climbing trees and that's not even a difficult tree to climb I've seen uh, leopards go straight up probably vertically about 20 feet straight up before getting to the branch and I've seen them do that with a fully grown female impala in their mouth so pound for pound the strongest cat very sharp claws designed for grabbing onto branches pulling themselves up and also designed for pulling down prey much bigger than themselves Andreas, no, I don't say I ever feel at risk, but every now and again you do get this feeling in the tummy. Like one time we had Tundi, we were parked pretty much as we are. Tundi walked behind our car and hoisted a water warthog up a tree. And then, because um, we don't have any doors in the car here, and then Tlalamba tried to follow her. And then they kind of got, we got between her and Tundi, and she tried to walk around the car. And I remember turning my head and looking at Tandy and she was about a meter from my foot she was looking at me with a very unhappy look on her face but we hadn't done anything wrong uh, her cub and her just kind of walked around our car and gotten a little bit separated and then she looked at me as if I was to blame but yes indeed it made my heart race a little bit these are still wild cats I mean we assume that they're never going to jump on the car and it is the behavior that they have exhibited for many many years but there's nothing really to stop them from doing so, apart from the fact they don't see us as food. So as long as we can maintain that discipline and that balance, we are perfectly safe on the car.
Marcy, I am looking everywhere, but I can't see Columba. I'm sure she's just having, she's lying flat somewhere here. I mean, there's lots of grass everywhere, lots of bushes. One thing I do remember, we were in this area. It was actually with you, Seb, the last time I saw Columba. We were just up the road here, and uh, Tundi had a kill. She had a warthog and a, no, a daker and a water buck. She was just up the road up a marula tree, and I mean, she was about 70 meters away from Talumba, who was two months younger than she is now, and she was just sort of on her own mission. <laughs> and mum would look and do that little, mm, mm, that little call, and uh, eventually she came back. But um, So I don't think she's too bothered by her. Leopards are very, very independent little animals, and she's probably meshing around looking for some Franklin or chasing ants or grasshoppers or something, something that young leopards do. But I wouldn't worry, but I'm sure she's here somewhere. Hmm, Aaron, favorite tree species to see a leopard. Well, that's quite hard, you know, Aaron, to see a leopard in a tree. It's all about, the, like, for example, these trees, these African weeping wattles are often very, very bushy, but the way she's positioned now makes it a perfect tree. But if she was on the other side, it would be a very bad tree. Marulas are often very, very good. Uh, leadwoods are very, very good. And in my past time up in sort of the middle of Kruger, we saw a leopard in a dead leadwood, and that was probably the most spectacular thing. Not a leaf or small branch on the tree whatsoever, and a leopard just sort of lying there in this gray sort of crocodile skin bark with a very blue background so i'd probably say a dead leadwood tree is my favorite to see them in but just seeing a leopard in a tree for me is very special it's a very popular and common sort of part of the sabi sands if you want to see a leopard this is the place to come and you can almost pick the tree you want to find them in. I've seen them in so many different trees. Well, we are going to stay here in hopes of Tlalamba materializing and Tundi maybe getting up and showing us some activity. While we do that, let's go to someone who's walking vigorously in the bush, Ralph Kirsten. Well, everyone, we're still on the lookout for anything special. Um, it's a little bit quiet still in that uh, just after midday, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit quiet um, uh, when it's quite warm out in the bush. But I'd like to ask you, what would you guys like me to look for while we're out here on the bushwalk this afternoon? You know, I've, I've spent so many years out here in the bush and shame Darby is just trying to negotiate his way down that termite mound. Don't fall, Darby. And... Um, I've spent so many years out in the bush here that sometimes you, you almost take a lot of things for granted. So, um, and also, you know, we feel sometimes that we repeat ourselves on many different topics. So I'd like you to throw some topics to me um, or things that you'd like reminding on, uh, things that you'd like new information on, whatever you like. Um, just as we're walking here... Uh, you know, one of the biggest things as we're walking through the bush, it, it all just looks like grass, doesn't it? But we've got, if we can just stop right here, we've got a lot of different species of grass here. This one is the little blue grass that I've spoken about before, where the little blue wax bull uses that uh, as um, nesting material. Okay, those little seeds give a little blue tinge to it, that's why it's called that. Not 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 a very um, palatable grass, uh, but still a grass all the same. Now, Alicia, I'm going to try and uh, find you lots of cool little insects. I will do that. Another one here that we have, this is called finger grass, for obvious reason. You see what it looks like there, up like the fingers pointing up. Okay. So nice and easy, that one. Also not a very palatable grass. So once again, we're getting an indication that this is not a particularly uh, a palatable area for animals. And this one being the herringbone grass, looking very much like on the cartoons when a, when a little cat eats a fish and uh, he pulls the bone out, uh, pretty much filleted and clean. 
So that's why it's called a herringbone grass, also not very palatable. And then the nasty buggers that we don't like, which also is one of the reasons why we wear gaiters, apart from the, the ticks, are these guys here. This is Aristida congesta, or the tassel three on. Now it's waving around a bit. Tassel three on, and it's called that because of these little seeds that they have there. They have three little awns on them, you see there. One, two, three, as I turn it sideways. But it's like a little spear that goes into your socks and very irritating. And it, look at the grass here. It is completely full of this stuff. So when you walk through here, these uh, tassel three awns really get into your socks and really irritate you. So wearing gaiters is one of the things that really helps um, uh, fight against that. Among, uh, apart from the ticks, that's one of the... The reason why we use that. And there's my gaiters, yes. And you can see these tassel three awns just sticking into my shoes as well. Lots of them there starting to irritate me already. That part of my shoe isn't very well protected, but that's what we do. So, and there's Darby. He's got hardcore canvas ones. Rogue. He is a rogue man. Yes. Okay, and I hear that somebody's also looking for an art far call. That's something that I'm going to look for. So, two things I'm going to be looking for. Interesting insects and an art far call. I think that's, that's fantastic. So, let's do that. Darby, that's the mission. Now, Beth, there's a couple of, there's a couple of plants that uh, are exotic and considered nuisances. Uh, one of them being the blackjack, which I think came over from Europe uh, in, with the horses. Um, and the blackjack, in, in Afrikaans, we call it very descriptive, knapse cattle, um, which is uh, the black seeds, quite similar to the Aristata congesta in the irritability that they give you. Um, but very straight seed, black and they literally stick on all your clothes, they stick on all your socks, and you've got to pu pluck them out uh, quite a lot. Um, and it's all these irritating plants like that that are pioneers, but normally um, also alien, so brought across from, from other countries, that really uh, become a problem. And their seeds are spread so easily because they normally uh, get stuck on the wool of the animals. Um, you know, in, in, the, in, in, the South East, uh, in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, where I'm from, uh, we get this, uh, it's, it's a jointed cactus. So it's a cactus that grows very close to the ground, very close to the ground like that, but it's got a lot of thorns on it. And um, as the animals walk past, those thorns go into their legs and you almost don't feel it. And, but their legs can be full of this stuff. And then obviously they bite it and pull it out, and, uh, but they spread that so much that it, it's really, really bad stuff. Um, another one being the queen of the night, which is also a cactus-like plant, um, very tall uh, cactus plants that you would think it would come from Mexico. I think they might even come from Mexico. Um, and they, uh, they flower at night. So that's why it's called Queen of the Night. Very good for ornamental plant, and that's why they were brought over. But um, uh, they also uh, encroach into areas quite prolifically. Uh, another one being the prickly pear. Very, very bad. The elephants love to eat it. And all of those cactus-like plants, as soon as you break a piece off of it, it falls on the ground, it can grow another one from there. So people think that elephants are eating those prickly pears and decimating them. It's far from the truth. That prickly pear will go through in their dung, and wherever they've broken a piece down on the ground, it will grow all over the place. So it literally, uh, it spreads like wildfire. It's terrible stuff. Really, really terrible stuff. So there are quite a few uh, exotic plants. Another one here that we get is a wild tobacco, which we generally find in the riverbeds, and it makes quite a pretty flower as well. Not good for smoking at all. I don't know why they call it a wild tobacco. I think it's just in the same family. Okay, I'm off to try and find some art folk and interesting insects, and while we do that, let's head you back to Steve with Tandy. It would be marvellous if you could find aardvark in the day. I've never seen that before, Ralph. Good luck. Here you can see the claws that she uses to climb up the tree. They are what we call, in lions and leopards, we call protractile claws. Some people mistake them for retractable claws. They're not retractable. They're able to be extended, which means they protract out. 
and then they go back in as its normal position. So by extending their, their wrist, they actually extend the claws out, and then when they relax, they come back in again. So not retractable, protractile. And then you can see she's revealing one of them for us now. Sorry, Igloo, I only got the last bit of your question there. Ravinda, no, she's still got some up there. Um, I can't see much of it. I wonder if you can see the leg behind her back leg. There we go. If you just punch in there, there you can still see the leg of the stenbok. Up, there we go. So there is still some up there, but we haven't seen too much of it. Um, there's not too much. Apparently, Ralph, when left this morning, there was still quite like the hind, hind quarters of the stenbok were still visible. And for her still to be up the tree, kind of defending it, means there's still enough meat to see her through another little while. Krufa Tandy is about 12 years old, I believe, somewhere in that range. She's been around for a long time, and she has been the mother to many cubs. So she is the, we'd call the new queen of Juma after Karula passed. Who was her mother, I believe? Am I right, Seb? Yeah. Yes. yes. So Shadow and T and uh, Tani. Shadow hasn't been seen in some time. They were sisters, and Shadow hasn't been apparently hasn't been the best mom. I don't know how many of her cubs have survived, but Tani's done very, very well. Very, very well over the years. But um, as Tristan has told me, Tristan is up in the Mara and I, I said that Tani's getting to the stage where she's going to stop breeding and this might even be her last litter. So this last legacy of hers, Tlalamba, which is awesome because it is a young lady and the young ladies are destined to stay within the area and it means we'll be able to document and follow this youngster around as it comes of age and sort of moves into the space of her mother, the Queen of Juma. Okay, well, we've got one of the big five that are not doing too much. Let's go over to someone who's got a big animal of the big five. Oh, I think we're live. Hang on a second. Sorry. Oh, are we live? We've just gone live. Okay, good. All right, we'll carry on with our elephants. You, please, as you were, squeeze past with our own means. Sorry about that, everybody. I was greeting some friends. I do have some. There they are. Uh, I do apologise for that. The elephants have just gone into a rather large thicket over here. Um, well, no, no, that's not your fault. Uh, Luke's just saying sorry. It's my fault entirely. Let's get one last view of them. I've been sitting here trying to do what we call an end board for a school drive. and it, I mean, the, it basically means I just have to deliver two lines or so uh, to the camera with the elephants in the background. You can't believe I talk for a living. I cannot believe how long it takes me to learn two lines of script. There we go. There's the cow. Our matriarch friend. Now there was talk of there being rain today. It's Slightly strange weathered afternoon. I don't think it's particularly uh, wet. I don't think it's going to get wet. But there's definitely a front coming through. And I suspect tomorrow morning will be quite chilly. Now, I made the assertion that I thought this cow was about 25 years old. I thought the youngster was probably that youngster I didn't actually give an estimate of I think probably about four and Paula you're wondering how I managed to do that well what you do Paula is you count the veins on the back of the ear and that gives you an idea Senzo I can't believe you actually believe me as well I'm talking rubbish um, it's it's just through guessing Paula it's through guessing and experience so I've learnt from people who'd been out here for much longer than I had and I'd say, how old is that elephant, how old is that elephant, and they'd tell me. And basically that's how I guess. 
And so it's very inaccurate. I mean, it could be entirely inaccurate. I, I don't think she's older than 25. She could be 30, but I think it's very unlikely. And basically it's from size, uh, skin condition, the shape of the back and the head. They get much more angular as they get older. And they also tend not to stop growing. I mean, they will slow down growing towards the end, but they do get taller and bigger uh, for the, their whole lives. You can see an old elephant. An old elephant looks like an old human being. There's that little wound that I told you about earlier. Now, I think that's a, a spike from a tusk. I think something's had a go at her there. Marvellous to have some elephants again. Sometimes, in a situation like this, Paula, when there are three elephants, I mean, if some fate was to befall the two calves here, she might live a solitary life, but most likely what will happen is that she would join another herd. When they get very old, however, then they do tend to leave the herd and go off towards softer foods on the rivers where they eventually die. But that's the only kind of real reason a female would choose to live on her own. It would be very unusual uh, for a female in good health to decide to live entirely on her own. Oh look, there we go. He's just trying to test his strength. Now I know that my parents, and certainly many of you on a Sunday afternoon, would have had a, a substantial nap. Uh, the elephants, Panzer, is that the name, Panzer? The elephants tend not to have an enormous sleep during the afternoon, and in fact, Pan Jack, sorry, they sleep very little. And the, it seems to be that the bigger a mammal is, the less it will sleep. And so I don't think that they sleep often for more than two or three or four hours a day. And when they're smaller, they sleep for much longer than that. So no, I don't think they would, have, they would doze much during the day. I have seen big bulls sitting on very hot days. I'll stand in the shade and they just sort of, you can see they're just not with it. They're flapping their, wing, their wings, their ears, and then they just kind of fast asleep. So that's what they do. But they don't sleep fully during the day and in fact a big bull elephant will sleep very little compared with a human being. All right, they've gone off into the thickets. I think we're going to press on, see what else we can find. We might see if we can head towards those big male lions at Chitwa. Oh, wrong gear. Ah, oh, no. Uh, I believe Steve has done very interesting things. He has changed position. Yes, well, Tandy got up and moved, and she's now hugging her little carcass. And for the sensitive viewers, you might not want to look at this now, but to look away if you need to. But here is the Steenbock's face, which has been badly, badly munched on by Tandy. Such an evil-looking look on it now. It is obviously very dead. But it's her prize. Poor little female Steenbock has fallen victim to the claws of this very good and professional hunter. She is repositioned and having a nice sort of sit down in the tree. <laughs> She's looking a little bit more comfortable than she was. Look at that. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> what a queen, eh? What a queen. Alexander, five years old? No, leopards, I don't believe, get more spots. They just grow into the spots more, and the spots get bigger and spread out. 
as you when we see Tlalamba, you'll see how many spots she's got. And those spots, just like the fur in the body, they, everything just expands and stretches. So they're very spotty at birth. And if anything, they get more golden in between the spots. So they're quite dark when they're younger. I think it aids in camouflage and also keeping them a little bit warmer. Because darker fur is, is more insulating than lighter fur. What is she spotted? Is she calling there? I wonder if she was looking to call. I think Clalampa moved off sort of northeast from where we are now. She's not looking in that general direction, but it's a good chance that she's circled around. And is maybe coming back. She's definitely interested in something, but there was also hyenas this morning. That's only might have spotted hyenas. She might have even spotted another animal to to prey on, such as a daker or another steenbok. Or an impala, who knows? But she's definitely showing some sort of interest there. And Pam Jack leopards can hunt daily. Um, they don't need to, but they, I mean they can hunt twice in a day, three times a day. It all depends on, on the conditions, uh, with the animals that they are hunting. Um, I've seen a leopard up a tree with a baby zebra and two warthogs, and we saw it catch that zebra in the morning and then successfully we didn't see it catch the warthogs, but they were there up in the tree with the, the zebra from the morning. So, And then they can also go days without hunting. So condition plays a big part, uh, not just the condition of the leopard, but condition of the prey animals. Um, as winter gets more and more dry and more and more harsh, your prey animals are weaker and much easier to catch. But then at the same time, the cover is blown a little bit for the leopards, and they have to work a little bit harder to hunt. Oh, that was a beautiful yawn. So there's nothing to stop her from hunting with a kill. I mean, for example, I'm really surprised that she's still got, well, she's still got meat here because um, she, uh, oh, she's eating again now. Because a steenbok is not a huge animal and she's been with it for, what, two days or something. There we go. She's calling. So I think she was already full when she caught this. There, she's busy calling her cub. Let's listen. Sorry, you might hear a vehicle. They're getting a little bit stuck over there. It's very sandy. They just need to engage their low low range. And she's coming down the tree. Should I move forward, Seb? You want me to stay there? No, we'll stay right there. I'm just going to move. See how she disappears in the long grass there. Very difficult to spot the spots. So you're being very opportunistic hunters. They will hunt as many times as they need to and if something just comes around while they're in a tree with a kill and a fool there's nothing to stop them going down and stalking and hunting again listen she's calling no lily there's not too much left there's still a little bit she's not giving it up yet she is calling her daughter to come and eat. The daughter she should not leave the table without finishing her meal. Here she comes, Seb. Yeah. Here she comes. Just in the long grass here. Between the bush. There we go. You got it? Yes. Clalamba. Hello, my gorgeous. Now, I don't know how I spotted her there. I think I felt her looking at me. There she's running. She's going to do a loop around. She's going to come back to mum. Her mum is going to give her a little cuddle and say, where you've been, you naughty girl? She's 
going to come through the vegetation there. Let's see if you can spot her coming, folks. This is going to be a bit of a show because she is extremely camouflaged. Tundi's in the same place. Columbus are directly in front of us now. There she is. There she is. Well done, Seb. She's coming all the way around. Mum is calling with the stem rock in her mouth. Sorry if my head gets in the way. I'm so excited. Tundi's in the same place. She's just here. Good girl, Tandy. Here she comes. There she is there. There she is. I'm just going to move forward because Shani's going to get her in the open here. She's going to come out, is she? Don't go in there, Tandy. That's very thick bush. Your little cub's about to sneak up behind you. There she comes, Seb. There she comes. Yes. <laughs> Give me my meat, Mum. That's what she's just said. Giraffe girl, my heart is bursting with happiness as well. I'm so happy to see this cub alive. Um, there was some doubt for some time, and we weren't able to see her, but them being out here in this sort of area, it's very hard to find them out here. Look at this vegetation. They're right there. They're right there. And unless Seb zooms in, you can't see it. Now the cub is in the long grass feeding on that, that stem box, and you can't even see her. There she is. Sorry about my breaks. Hello, gorgeous mama. <laughs> this is the best thing ever. She has grown so much. She's so cheeky. She's been off gallivanting. And she's still little. She's still little. I was thinking after two months she would have grown more. But, I mean, I want to see her in the open. But she's still very little. She's definitely becoming a little leopardess. She's going to get Aubrey, one of the game viewers. He's just coming in to join us. Oops, you can just come around this side, eh? Okay, well, it looks like Ralph has found, and we're looking to make a promise to all of you. Let's go see what he's found. That I have indeed, everybody. Here we are, next to a termite mound, but a termite mound that's got quite a big cavity in it over there. Now, there is nobody else that could make a cavity like that other than an artwork. So, whoever was looking for an artwork burrow, here is one. And, well, let's have a look inside there. It, it is quite deep. That goes in for at least a meter and a meter and a half as I put the light on it. And then it goes up and around the corner. Now, the reason behind that is you want to have that little bowl there at the bottom so that it goes up. So when it rains, the water will obviously sit in that little bowl and you can then get up and be high and dry. And that's what the art fark has done. And afterwards, warthogs can also use this burrow, and they do something similar as well. They'll also make a little ledge like that, so especially the piglets can go and sit up on, on that little ledge because they don't have as much meat on them as mommy does, and uh, they need to sit up nice and warm out of the water. Sometimes mommy will sit in that bowl, and uh, she will then, uh, but she's got enough meat on her to stay uh, warm even when she's wet. But the little piglets up. Uh, out uh, on on the dry stuff. Um, there's a lot of animals that will use art fork burrows, so they are the unsung heroes of the bush, uh, because not only warthogs will use them, jackals will use them to den in. We've seen that many times before. Hyenas, we've seen that here on Juma plenty as well. Leopards will put their cubs in uh, these uh, uh, art fork burrows too. I'm sure lots of you have seen that. Even lions will do that as well. Honey badgers, 
Uh, I, can I think of any other mammals? If we go on to reptiles, we talk about the monitor lizards. They can use that as their home. Black mambas and other different snakes will also use that uh, to hibernate in. Um, then we also talk about birds. Uh, there's a couple of birds that will use this as a nesting site. Uh, one being the blue swallow and another one being the South African shell duck. So there is a number of animals that really rely on art fog. And you know what? There's some that even don't exist where you don't get um, art fog. Now, Paula, this, this kind of hole here is generally uh, the, the size of, uh, of an art fog burrow. Um, but uh, the question remains, how big does it get on the inside? Well, it, 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 it all depends on how many uh, the, the little art fog has in his family or if he's making it as a den site. Mostly, uh, they dig uh, just an evening shelter uh, that they'll go in overnight and then they'll move on. But when they make themselves an actual den site, it can be rather large on the inside so they are fascinating and I tell you what you don't get many warthog where you don't get art fog because they are almost solely reliant on an art fog for their burrows yes they will excavate a little bit more around it uh, and on the inside but they cannot dig that with their snout which is what they use to excavate so just imagine trying to excavate this massive hole here entirely with your snout now Kathy, I've seen quite a number of, of art fog in my life, mostly at night, okay, um, and, and being quite lucky here in the Kruger Park, but I haven't seen most of them here in this uh, area that we're in right now. I've seen one or two at night, um, but in the Eastern Cape where I am from, it is quite unusual there. We see a lot of art fox. And uh, one of my friends and, and uh, a mentor for me as well, Dale Geldenais, that I used to work with, try and say that one, Geldenais, um, a very good friend of mine, uh, and he's more experienced than me. He had been working uh, in the bush for almost 20 years, and he had never seen an art fog. He had seen the tracks, and, and I, we used to laugh at him because we often had the tracks going past his tent in the morning, and we used to say to him, Dale, didn't you see that one? But uh, no, so they're very secretive, very difficult to see, um, but they leave their signs all over the place, and such wonderful burrow diggers. They're uh, very... Uh, um, important for the ecosystem out here. Now there is one little thing I do want to show you just before you go off to all the other exciting things and this is just one of the things that um, um, is so impressive in the bush. When a little bird finds a buffalo thorn which is full of thorns there and he makes his little nest up in there. Now I'm sure this is something like a terrestrial brown bull um, or something along those lines because it's a very sticky nest but I, I can't, I'm not going to attempt to climb in the tree because I think I might disturb it but uh, I'm pretty sure there's a cup or a bowl on the inside so it looks a little bit haphazard on the outside but I think on the inside there it is quite uh, uh, bowl shaped and quite organized and maybe even some spider web to make it soft on the inside there and that's something looking like a little terrestrial brown bull but what a clever way to defend your nest nice inside a buffalo thorn tree uh, it's just absolutely fascinating how nature works huh? so we go from one amazing thing the art fork burrow and we've spotted now a little I think a terrestrial brown bull nest in this buffalo thorn. That is absolutely fantastic. Now, I've fulfilled the one promise. We need to start looking for some special insects, don't we? Yeah, well, Columba has come out and uh, Tandy has provided her with the remainder of that steambok. But now they are both, uh, well, Tandy's lying flat. And Columba's in there somewhere. There she is. Busy feeding on the remains of the steambok. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but it's just this little hops, hops, hops sound as she's munching on the bone or the skin. Tundi was so accommodating bringing it down for her, saying, Come on, child, it's time to eat. Most parents will understand that. The kids are too busy having fun to remember to eat. Hmm. 
child of the universe, most cats have the protractile claws. Um, cheetah, their claws don't go back um, because they are not true cats. They, they stay out very much like a dog, same as hyena, and that is to give them grip, just like we, when we're studs in our shoes for running, gives them grip for speed and running along the ground. Whereas cats like leopard, lion, uh, house cats, wild cats, uh, genets, they all have very sharp protractile claws which enables them to climb trees and also potentially to catch their prey which they then grab onto with both feet front and back and the leopard and the domestic cat have that very good ability to grab something with the front paws and then sort of eviscerate the stomach with with their back feet which is always quite fun my cat used to do it to me all the time when it suddenly kind of lost its mind and suddenly attack my hand and then clawed it all over the place and that is purely a function of ability to help them climb if they can't climb uh, and not, not easy for them to get away a leopard needs to be able to take its food up the tree uh, we've seen cheetah lose their prey many 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 times many times because they don't take their prey up the tree um, and leopards are able to then feed on their prey for days and days and days Just have another vehicle coming in to join us. Texan from Vuya Taylor. The vegetation is very thick around here. And you have to be very careful because as Ralph is talking about the aardvark burrows, there's lots and lots of aardvark burrows all around here. So repositioning might be quite tricky. But while we stay here and hope the little youngster comes out, let's go over to James and see what he's up to. Well, we're approaching the site of the Avoca males. I believe that they are flatter than the proverbial pancake. In other words, they are very enthusiastically performing the way that lions do best. But nevertheless, we shall assess them, and perhaps we shall even be able to give them uh, some kind of characterization. I don't think we've quite got a handle on who's who yet amongst the coalition. I just need to find out the correct road. I'm not very good at my roads on Chitwa at the moment. I think they're along here somewhere. They're on a road called Mike's Kitchen, which is quite interesting. I just hope I can find Mike's Kitchen. I think it's down this way. I hope it's down this way. My only doubt is that there are hundreds of uh, general game individuals around here. There are waterbuck and nyala and impala. In fact, masses of impala. A wildebeest. It's not looking very hopeful at this stage. I might have to consult my map, actually. Let me open this up. Um, right, maps. I also think I'm getting a flat tyre. That's really not good. Ah, I see this particular map doesn't have any road names on it, so that's not very good. Um, I would have thought it was down here. I might be wrong. There are masses of general game. I think I would have thought that was Mike's kitchen over there. Let's just stop here for a second. There are some animals, and uh, you can see we just passed that little sort of uh, bush dinner site, and I think that is Mike's kitchen as far as I understand it. This is a classic Sabi Sand picture. The bull wildebeest hopefully waiting for females to come and see him and making sure that he's safe by lurking around with a herd of impala. And he's just scraping his pedal glands on the ground there. 
to make sure that any other bull wildebeest that comes past here knows that he is in charge of this territory, devoid as it is of females. Now, what you see in the background there are the most common antelope that we get here. Of course, those are the impala, and they are cheetah cat, the ecological equivalent of springbok in this area. We do not see any springbok in the Kruger Park area. In fact, they only occur where the rainfall is probably about 400 millimeters and below. So they are a truly desert-adapted species, which the impala are inescapably not. And so for those of you who don't know, a springbok is basically the, well, it's the only Southern African gazelle that we get. And it is our national animal, but you don't get any of them over here. All right, let's keep moving and see if we can't find where these lions are. There's a nasty feeling I may have the road wrong, but, you know, we'll figure it out eventually. sure I hope nice place to have supper especially when it's nearing full moon as it is now and one second let me just reverse here Let me try and figure out where Mike's kitchen is exactly. In the meantime, let's see if Ralph can find any other kind of kitchen where he is on foot. Well, everyone, we've um, we've just been looking for all these little insects, but I can I can tell you at this time of year. Um, things start to get a little bit quiet on the insect front uh, in this part of the world because a lot of these insects that we have here are um, summer active. So like the dung beetles, like some of, a lot of the spiders um, and the centipedes, millipedes, we don't really see them in winter. So it's actually quite tough to find um, insects uh, as we head into autumn and going into winter it's quite difficult uh, we don't see any more of the the dung be beetles at all they're already gone we, they're actually yeah it's it's a uh, it's been a week or two since since we've seen any at all but here comes some elephant dung up front here and that's normally a hot spot for little for little insects and critters on the inside so let's have a look we don't want to disturb them too much because you know, it's also their little home. So if we just lift it up, normally we can place it straight back underneath afterwards. And there's a little ant's nest. And these look like they could be harvester ants. They look nice and closely in there. There's still reasonably fresh elephant dung as well. It's not, it's not terribly old. Um, it's not terribly fresh, but it's not terribly old, should I say that. It's still a bit moist. Um, but also, when you when you lift up something like this, you also want to be a little bit careful because you, you are messing with quite a few insects and things home. So what I do is I normally just put it up on its side, have a look, and then you can just try and place it back exactly where you found it. Um, but we do want to have a look and see what is happening around there. And you see all of these little ants. What they're doing is they're also taking little grass clippings down but they're not um, feeding on it uh, as the termites would do they're able, able to um, digest cellulose a little bit better than, than the, the termites so they're not using those fungus gardens and these ants um, can also be uh, forming a big part of the um, art fox diet uh, come winter time. Uh, so in summer they feed predominantly on termites, but in winter they can start to go a lot more onto these little ants. Now I think we'll just close up there and just let them get back to their business. And let's lift, lift this one up and just see if there's anything else uh, running around. But as I say, you see it's very... Oh, there's more ants. Okay, so that's another little ant nest, but there's not a hell of a lot of other things around. Let's have a look here. Gary, um, I haven't particularly found any fossils in the bush. We have seen some that have been um, fo uh, fossilized into rocks 
uh, in Namibia, uh, little snails and fish and so on. But what we do find quite a lot around these areas here uh, are the old uh, human habitation um, where the people have made uh, stone uh, tools and also pottery. Um, there's a lot of that uh, around the Kruger National Park area, especially up the northern part in the Makuleki. So that's mostly what we found. There, see a lot of ant activity around these elephant dungs. And um, normally, if this was in full summer or springtime, a lot of this dung would have been worked um, by the dung beetles. So at the moment now, it's actually just going down more so to the little ants and the harvester ants. So they, they do continue through the winter a little bit, but they find places like under a nice um, uh, elephant dung and so they do assist a little bit in the in the um, decomposition of this of this energy that is now being placed here and they also use it as a very good nesting site so we're still on the hunt for some interesting insects but they're all interesting in their own right even though they're quite common these harvester ants they're still fulfilling a very important role magic dragon wizard I'm going to find you a plant that uh, acts as an antiseptic. This one over here is not uh, one of those that acts as an antiseptic. However, very easy to identify. And when I used to teach my students, as soon as you see this, uh, you've got three main veins coming from the base. You see that? One, two, three. And we say black monkey orange. Mm -hmm. So it's a black monkey orange, nice simple leaf with three main veins coming from the base, black monkey orange. You see nice straight branches. These trees are the ones that um, they produce a very nice round fruit, very hard outer casing, and they very often hollow them out, and then uh, they can be used as uh, souvenirs or salt and pepper pots. So very nice, black monkey orange. Um, the one that I'm looking for is actually the sickle bush. The sickle bush is the pharmacy of the bush. And when I find one, I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm not seeing any around here. That is an acacia because it's got thorns on it, not spines. Um, we're looking for uh, the one that looks similar, the sickle bush, but it doesn't have thorns. It has spines. Now, what is the difference? Well, a thorn is a modified leaf and a spine is a, modif a modified branch. So a thorn grows next to an axillary bud, whereas a spine grows from an axillary bud. I'm getting very technical now. Let's just look for that um, sickle bush, which I'm not seeing for the minute. Okay, while I look for my sickle bush, and uh, I'm sure I'm going to find one just up ahead here, let's head you on over to James with those wonderful cats. Well, they might be wonderful when they're sitting up doing something useful, but this thing barely opened its eyes as we drove in. It's one of the Avoca males. I'm told the other two are here. I can see one, but I cannot see the third. Anyway. We have lions. It's good. It's getting cooler. Sun's starting to set. Possibly good for us to settle in for the long haul. If not too many people want to come in here. And just as you look at that flat cat there, at least you can see the vegetation, which uh, tends not to run away or go to sleep. But it is starting to turn. Can you see that? We're getting the autumnal colours here, and we don't get great sprays of uh, burgundies and pinks and things that you do uh, in <laughs> in the northern reaches of the world. It just kind of goes yellow and then leaves fall off. Uh, Puma, you say OMG James found them. Um, well, I, I don't know to be whether to be insulted or uh, pleased by that comment, O oh, uh, Puma. I didn't actually find them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Somebody told me where they were, and I had quite a lot of help from David, who was here this morning. Thank you, David. Well, they're having a very nice long Sunday siesta. And in fact, one would um, 
One would question whether they were in fact still extant. If one didn't know that they were alive, wouldn't you? I'm not sure that we'll spend too long here. I think we'll probably go back towards the waterhole, see if Hosanna doesn't pop his head out. Apparently he was around here earlier today. But Hosanna on the hunt will be inescapably more entertaining than this lot. Now, I thought yesterday when I was on my walk that the roaring sound of lions in the distance was these guys calling Joyce. And that would have signified, of course, that they were solidifying their domain. But I was then told subsequently that it wasn't them, because I think Steve was quite close to them, if not actually with them, when I heard that roar. Uh, so, uh, I don't know for sure. I think somebody's told me that he's heard them roaring. In fact, we have definitely heard them roaring. Yeah, we know we they have roared. And I think there's probably been very little response. And so here they remain. Very comfortable. I think the next step, I think that they are going to be here to stay. I can't see any reason for them not to stay around if the Birminghams don't come back up north. And I can't see any reason why the Birminghams would come back up north. And so, uh, let us assume that these fat fellows take over here. I'm not sure what's going to happen with the young members of the Inkuhumas. As I said yesterday during our character catch-up show, it's, uh, I think the youngest cub is, how old is the youngest cub? The youngest cub must be just under a year, I would have thought. And then the rest of them are almost two. And I think they'll be okay. But the youngest cub could still be in trouble. That is the sound of an aeroplane coming over, everybody. Sorry about that. Now, I suppose the obvious question for those of you who haven't been watching for a long time is where are the Birmingham boys? Well, at the moment, we think they are down south on the Sand River, probably close to the salubrious environs of Alonda Lawsey or Singita or Mala Mala. Very famous names, those. Oh, is there mud here, is there? Senzo was just telling me that there's mud on my jacket. Now it's on his jacket. And, um, okay. sorry about that. In fact, there's more than that on his jacket. I didn't, I took us through some fairly muddy patches earlier. Sorry about that. Uh, so I think that's where they are. And that hole, in case you missed the discussion, that hole's been created by the demise of the long standing Majingalane coalition. And so I think that's left a void for the Birmingham boys of probably two or three prides in a very prey-rich environment. And I think that's just where they're hanging out. I think it's probably a slightly more, well, one hesitates to say a better choice of territory, but I think there's more opportunity for them down there than there is up here. And so I think these guys are just gonna drift in here without too much of a fight. As we sit here, all of us wondering when they're going to get up and do something. Of course, lions can sleep for up to 20 hours of the day, Marcy, and so to say that they would get up at any specific time to go hunting would be incorrect. And I mean, we have sat with flat cats deep into the evening thinking, well, they're definitely going to get up now. They're so hungry. They must start hunting now. Ooh, it's getting dark. They're definitely going to get up now. Ooh, they're turning around and stretching a little bit. They're definitely going to get up now. I need to watch them fall fast asleep again. So it really is difficult to say. These guys look fairly fat to me, and I don't think they're in need of a huge meal. They could conceivably sleep here for the rest of the night. But I suspect they will get up as the sun goes down and as it gets dark. And let me just check my time. I mean, that's only going to be, the sun will go down in about 20 minutes or so. 
Now, Juma is about 1,200 hectares, Chitra Chitra about 800 hectares, so that gives us a total traversing area of 200 hectares or about 5,000 acres. And, sorry, I missed the name there, was it Jamelia? Jamelia? Bromelia? Vanilia. Vanilia, like vanilla, but uh, with a mix up of the back letters. Very nice, vanilla. Um, vanilla? I th so, you know, Juma and Chitra together are not large enough to house one pride in this area. You'd probably find a pride like the Inkuhumas has got a territory of about eight to 10,000 acres, about, what is that, say, three and a half thousand hectares or so. And so Juma doesn't have a number of prides, but the boundary between the Styx Pride and the Inkuhuma Pride runs pretty much along the line where those elephants were walking today, just south of an area called Twin Dams. Um, and if I hadn't handed over the, my map to Steve, I could show you uh, where I meant by that. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, you can check it out on Google Earth if you want to. You can see all of those landmarks. And, and, and then the, the Inkuhuma Pride territory goes way into the west and north of us and the Styx Pride, obviously, we're in the Styx Pride territory now. Remember, and this is very NB for anybody who's interested in lions, males are not part of the Pride, and that's really important for people to realize. They are extra to the Pride. They form a coalition like this one here, and in their domain will fall anything between one and four Prides, maybe in up to five perhaps in some cases, certainly the Majingalan had at least five in their territory. These chaps here, at the moment, if they do take this territory, will have the sticks and the Nkuhumas and perhaps the Torchwood Pride as well. That will be their domain. But a lot of their activity will take place off Juma. Now, Ralph has managed to achieve the impossible. He seems to have found a puddle. Well, yes, everyone, I have indeed found a puddle, but it's a very interesting puddle at that. Um, it's got lots of algae in it, and that's probably as a result of this little puddle or pond being in the full sunlight day in and day out. So it probably gets rather warm in the water here. But um, quite interesting, there's all sorts happening in this little pond. Apart from the algae, there's little insects on top of the water that uh, they obviously aren't breaking the surface of the, the water, and they're able to run on top. And those are like little pond skaters and midges. But there is a little character that we're waiting for him to poke his head up any minute now above the surface of the water because he needs to come up for a breath. So we're just waiting for him. He went under a little minute ago. And we're going to just wait a little while and I'm sure he's going to pop up. But there are all sorts of little insects. We often get... Um, the uh, the pond skaters as I mentioned but uh, while we're waiting for him to pop his head head up there's a there's another little guy here that's just in one of these little tracks here and that's actually in the track of the animal that I'm talking about that we're waiting for him to come up uh, oh it looks like he's almost attacking my stick so that is a little spider I'm not sure on the exact kind it might be one of the little fishing spiders oh straight along the surface of the of the water there. Now, the difference between an insect and a spider, spider, well, an arachnid, an arachnid got eight body parts and eight, uh, sorry, not eight body parts, four body parts versus three body parts of the, of the, of the insects, as well as um, they've got eight legs and the insects have got six. So a couple of little differences there. And that little spider there is one of the more primitive of the two groups of spiders. We get mygalomorphs and araneomorphs. Mygalomorphs are the primitive ones. They don't build nests or, or web.
eggs. They um they stay on the ground and they actively hunt out their prey, like that little guy was doing there. He was just waiting there in ambush for maybe one of these little midges to come along and maybe he could catch it there. Araneomorphs, they build their webs and they stay up almost vertical, most of them, but some of them also do hang upside down and do all sorts of funny things. But where is our character that's going to pop his head up? I'm just waiting for him. There's lots of bubbles, and that can be all sorts of things. Um, oxygen being released out of the mud below uh, with the roots of the plants that are all growing in the area here. They could be releasing a little bit of oxygen and hydrogen. Um, and he's now acting a little bit like Scuba Steve, uh, the hippo. He's being all shy as soon as we put the camera on. But come on, poke your head up. But you see, don't just walk past a little pond like this. There's all sorts happening. Uh, I think we're going to be out of luck. He's holding his breath for quite a long time now. Surely. Okay. Everyone, I think we're out of luck. He's uh, given us the slip, as per usual. Just my luck, eh? Hey? But anyway, from one little body of water to another, off to Steve. Yes, well, we have managed to find the gang of geese once again. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear we're about to get a flyby of a hummerkop. That wasn't very easy to see. He was just flying straight at us there, but we are looking at the, the gang of geese, and they are still seven. Dad is nowhere to be seen, though, so there's a concern. But Mom, or we think it's Mom, we've just been with them as they just careened through the beautiful green water in the afternoon sun. And now they're on the other side, drying themselves off in a very strange place. They could still be in the sunshine if they're on the opposite side of the dam. But at least we know that the parenting is going well. She seems to be looking left and right and everywhere. Where has Dad gone off to? Has he gone for a cheeky one down the road? <laughs> Seb giggles. That knowing giggle of a father, hey, Seb? Just a quick cheeky one. Kathy and Paula, yes, there are still seven. We're going to try and make a daily thing, try and catch up on these geese and see how they are doing. These are the days of the geese lives, it seems. And then they go again. Fantastic. We were hoping for that. Oh, and we've got our one hippo here who doesn't want to lose any thunder. He wants to be the star of the show as well. And chances are if we keep the frame on him, he will not do that again. But the geese are cruising again seems like absolutely no reason why they went all the way across there probably left dad he was following and then mum has looked back and been like dad has slipped us there we go is she calling what's she doing dad has slipped the, slipped the geese and he's off wow they're making a noise okay uh I don't know. You want to know the gender of Egyptian geese? I've never actually spent any time trying to identify male and female. Um, I've always just noticed that the, the female, or the, they all seem to hang around one. So I'll have a look. I don't think that there is a difference. I just I can't remember it. Let me tell you now. No. Okay, so basically the male is larger with a thicker neck. And it's definitely the call, and the female is smaller, with a slimmer neck. So it's very hard to say. But they do have a different call. The male is uh, not as loud and raucous as the female's call. But they look the same. The only reason I think, or say a female, is because the youngsters seem to be hanging around closer to, to one. So I can only assume it's mum. So sorry, Kay, I can't give you any definitive answers there well we moved off from Tundi and Cub just to allow other vehicles a moment we thought we'd come and check on the, the geese and the lone hippo Andreen, I'm not sure how long they'll stay with the parents but a couple months or so they off they are looking after themselves really they're already feeding themselves Andreen, they're already feeding she's just 
keeping a watchful eye, but soon they'll fledge and they'll get bigger and they'll be able to fend for themselves and go off and find a mating pair for themselves for their life, but ne definitely the next few months or so. <laughs> okay, so we're going to leave you, head back to Tandy now with some nice afternoon sun, and let's go to something flatter than the water, James and his lions. Well, there's some movement there, everybody. The aeroplane is taking off and it has disturbed this male lion who opened his eyes and then moved his head downwards and then flicked his ear. Oh! Senzo's heart rate is through the roof. He can barely control his excitement. David tried to climb off the car in terror at the lion, moving his ear like that. I had to save them. Uh, and Luke, uh, who's a new director, of course, says that it would be a great idea to do an unscheduled broadcast to Facebook with these lions because the sighting is so action-packed. I couldn't agree more, Luke. Let's go live to every page we can. This is not a sighting you're going to see very often. You will seldom see such impressive sleeping skills on anything other than either a Wild Earth presenter or a deeply drunk teenager. Lovely, you want to know about the names of these cats, and in fact, uh, I think last week during our show, there were some names suggested. What were they? They were, um, I forget exactly what they were. They were quite funny, though. We named them after avos, that's right. It was, there we go, guacamole, chip, and dip. Um, that is not an official name of these animals. They are not called guacamole, chip, and dip. They have yet to be named, and I think we should probably get on to that process fairly soon. We should possibly name them after different synonyms for sleep. Slumber. Passed out. Dead. What we should call them. Minamu. <laughs> I always laugh when I hear that name because I'm not sure if you realize Minamu. Maybe you've named yourself after this uh, Afrikaans cartoon that I used to watch as a child. Uh, it was called Minamu, and the, um, the theme tune is stuck in my head and will be forever, lamentably so. Um, they will get their full manes probably in about three years or so. Uh, they will start to look full maned in about a year and a half or so, I guess. That will probably be when you'd expect them to have the good sort of uh, Birmingham-sized males, but they'll keep growing for the rest of their days. So that's what will happen there. So I'm not sure where the third one is. And also that chap's just flicking his tail. I'm just going to move everyone because there are two other vehicles here and I just want to get out the way, otherwise no one else is going to be able to see them. Um, as I do that, the question of cubs has been raised by Sharon and whether this lot would be able to sire cubs. Yes, technically they have the equipment and the maturity to sire cubs at this stage. But whether or not they would be able to convince a pride of females to allow that, I'm not really sure. I still can't see number three. Anyway, that's what's going on here. Uh, all I'm saying there is that until they take over territory, until the pride females decide that they are going to accept them as male, well, they don't have to accept them, but until they are able to kind of impose themselves on the pride, they won't breed then, no. Okay. What kind of car is that? Ah, it's a converted Ford. It's quite nice. Everybody, I think let's let's leave at the moment.
simply because there's quite a lot of pressure being brought to bear on them. So let's just head out. We'll try and come back uh, perhaps when it gets a bit darker and we'll see if they don't get up. Um, while we head out of here, um, they do have these wispy sort of teenagerish type manes. They're not that wispy, they're getting them. And Taya, I think they're probably pretty similar to the main sizes of the Birmingham's at the same age. I'm just trying to remember, we, we did meet the Birmingham's at roughly the same age. The Birmingham's, I think, were a little bit older than these guys when we first met them, but roughly the same age, yeah. And roughly the same kind of mane. Sorry, there was just a bit too much pressure going on there because they were in that big thicket, and I think we were hemming them in, so I just thought, let's just head out of here. Alrighty, we're going to go down towards Chitra Dam and see if we can't pick up some alarm calls from Hosana, perhaps. Now, look at this, everybody. There is a lot of ants here up on the tops of these uh, grass stalks. And it, they're not... They look like they might be cocktail ants. They st I'm not... I don't, they're not cocking their, their abdomen upwards. They're cocking it downwards. So this is a strange species of ants, and they're doing strange things here as well. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. Initially, I thought they were gathering the seed husks or the seeds from the grass, um, but now uh, it doesn't look like they are. You know, normally uh, ants are very, very uh, important for the ecosystem because they will gather a lot of seeds and they take it down uh, underground and they do feed on the husk and leaving the seed behind. And then you've got all these seeds that remain in chambers underneath the ground. And if there are times of drought, well, I tell you, there can be even past 10 years can pass. And um, if there then is some rain, you've got from these pockets of seeds that the ants have stored below the ground, you can have the revival of, of many different grass species. But um, what these guys are doing now, I'm not quite sure. Some of them are carrying other ants. And a moment ago, we did see a procession of Matabili ants come across the road. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if these guys have all climbed up on top of the top of these uh, grass stalks and so on to get away from them. Because Matabili ants are ruthless, as the name suggests. The Matabili was an offshoot of the Zulu tribe. Um, but they, uh, as that tribe moved through southern Africa, they decimated uh, all, the tri all the villages and tribes that they came across. So the, the Matabili ants are quite similar in what they do. They also decimate all the little other ants that they find, ants and termites, and they steal all their uh, eggs and, and pupa, and they'll eat that. Now, Linda, I agree with you. Absolutely amazing, aren't these ants? Very cool. And what would we do without them? They, um, they, you know, people think that sometimes they pests in their garden because they, you know, they they do cut a lot of the grass and so on in in little patches. But uh, it it's still we need them to, you know, keep the balance in the ecosystem. And there's so many different species of ants that we know nothing about. And also, their communication is one of the most complex of all the animal kingdom. And in fact, in the world, bees and ants and uh, these kind of uh, um, little creatures have got the most complex uh, communication system. It's all about smells and dances and how you move, etc. They've got a caste system. So, You've got soldiers, you've got workers, you've got reproductives, and everybody just selflessly, selflessly, lessly goes about their business and their job. And it just works like clockwork. Nobody complains, everybody just does their job. It's, it's, um, it's quite interesting. My little boy watches B-movie quite regularly. And... Um, Yes, sorry. Can you just repeat that question for me? I'm just I'm I'm asking for a question. Ivy's got a question for us, and I just want to. Now, Ivy, you want to know if they ever rest? Well, that's a very good question. I don't think that they completely rest. No, but I do. There is a definite time of uh, uh, very low activity, and because they are also ectothermic, so when it's very cold, they are very, um, uh, you know. 
they don't have much activity at all. They do still move around though, um, but as they warm up, then they will have more activity. And that's often why they stay under the ground, because then they maintain their, their warmth and um, they can then also keep their activity up below the surface of the soil. And out here on top, these ants are all doing strange things. Yes, my little boy, he watches Bee Movie quite regularly. He's a little three-year-old, and uh, he loves Barry B. And it's it's just a very, I think it's a fascinating movie. It just really paints, puts it into perspective as well, um, in, a, in, a, in a very humorous way. But um, the caste system and how things are just, uh, just done without questioning. Eh? And uh, I think ants are very similar, as well as wasps. But ants and bees, very complex. A love app, good question there. Uh, queens, they can live for many, many years because they're fed um, and they're fattened up. And I've heard that they can even live over 10 years. Um, and a colony is all dependent on having a queen. So uh, if, a, if a queen is uh, getting in trouble or, or um, getting sick and not producing properly, well, the colony is, is then sick as a whole. So... Um, it's very important for them to also maintain and get more reproductives. Now look out over here. There's a lot of them all on top of these little flower pods. It's really interesting. And they don't seem to be doing anything obvious. So that is very intriguing indeed. And, well, everyone... From those exciting little critters, we're going to head off down the road and see what else we can find. But, very exciting, Steve's found something wonderful for you. Yes, we have, and she seems to have wrestled away the remainder of the Steenbuck carcass from Tlalumba, and there is no sign of the little devil anywhere. We are back on the scene. The other vehicles have since left just in time to spot her before the night shrouds over and I have no doubt this will be the final feeding she has on this little carcass there's not too much there she keeps turning up and sticking up her head and looking around it's a vulnerable time for her My hyenas are lurking well they were this morning anyway and this is the time they would come back again but she is right at the base of a marula tree. She could spring up there in seconds. And that is why they choose to, to feed at the base of trees like that if they don't hoist so that they can escape if they need to. They're very alert. You can see her ears are always checking every sound in the background. Martha, how many leopards can live in an area, you would like to know? Well, it all depends on the food resource and the habitat availability. And, I mean, we have the potential to see 9 or 12 leopards in and around this area. So it's a, a marvelous number. There is an enormous number of small animal species in the form of scrub hares, stenbok, dacre, impala. So the food availability is, is really, really good. That's what enables us to have so many um, so many spotted cats in one place but it all depends on the resources and the fact is that the habituation of leopards have been going for so long that we know the leopards and find them all the time so they're quite relaxed so we get to at least account for how many leopards there are there's other reserves i've been to that you can't you don't know how many leopards are because they're not relaxed so benjamin these leopards are related the leopards in southeast asia are actually subspecies and there's not too much difference in them. I think there's maybe a small bit of weight in, in the, the Indian leopard, but I think comparatively they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's just separated by geographical time. Um, but then, you know, we've also got a species of leopard down in the Cape in South Africa that is exactly related to this, but genetically they are much smaller, and that's because their prey food is far smaller in size. Um, they're about half the size of these guys, so they're very, very small, the Cape Leopard, although they are the same species, but just through geographical separation and food availability and food size, they've evolved to be a much smaller cat. 
How beautiful is she? See, she's very alert. Very, very alert. Nice to see you, Tandi. It's been some time. She's even more alert because she's got a cub somewhere around here. So she'll be wondering what it's up to, first of all. But we've seen her climbing. She climbs the trees pretty well, so if anything did happen to spook her, she would immediately get up into the safety of the tree canopy. And interestingly enough, we don't see too many male leopards on this side of the property. I think Gajima occurs this side up into Bufasuk. Not that I've ever seen him before. But also because the vegetation is so thick here, it's very hard to really figure out where the leopards are coming and going on our eastern boundary. Beautiful habitat for them. Okay, well, it seems like James has left his lines, but I believe he's still on Chitwa, so let's go see what he's up to. We're having the most wonderful time here at the waterhole, watching the baby hippos there, all of whom were too small to leave their mothers sort of a few months ago, now living in this little pod in the shallows next to that island, and I think there are about six of them, and they're having such a fun little play. That one is just yawning a little bit. You saw him sticking his tongue around. They've been pushing each other about, and the one, the biggest one closest to us, I think, is a sort of sub-adult, and he's just kind of watching over these chaps and bullying them a bit from time to time. There's ones underneath the... underneath the... I think that thing's fallen over a bit as well. <laughs> In fact, it definitely has. That tree that those guys are playing around with, I think they've been digging away slowly, unintentionally at its base, and it started to lean heavily. You might also be able to get those kingfishers, can you, Sindel? Well done. Five kingfishers. This is called advanced camera work, everybody. This is not for the faint at heart. There we go. He's even gone with a super zoom. Good grief, he's feeling brave this evening. Well done, Sindel. Excellent job. So there's the pied kingfishers, obviously having some kind of a spat. It is Sunday night, of course, the pressures of the week starting to build, and they're all, of course, talking about uh, what they have to do. Oh, green-backed heron. Beautiful spot there, Senzel. Disappeared over the back of the damn wall. Let's go back to the hippopoptomai. Now, I don't know about any of you, and I think I've said this to a few of you before, but my very worst feeling as a child was Sunday evenings. The thought of going back to school after a fun weekend, especially as the winter started to take a hold of Johannesburg, really was deeply miserable, and I actually used to get a kind of nauseous feeling in my belly. And it is such a magnificent feeling every Sunday evening out here when I realize and remember, even though I left school some 25 years ago, it's such a great feeling to know that tomorrow ah, I just get to do the same fun stuff again. Just look at these little chaps under the base of the tree there now. Oh, they're too cute. Now, you can see that those hippos are standing there, and I've said to you often that hippos cannot swim, as have all of the guides. And, Kathy, it's got to do with their density. They just sink. They don't float. It's not that they can't swim. In, by that I mean it's not, it's not that they have an inability to swim. It's that they sink. And it's so that they can stay under the surface without sort of trying to, if you know what I mean. They can stay safe under the surface. So where they're standing there, they will just be able to kind of lie down and not float to the top, which you couldn't do. You would struggle to do that. 
they can absolutely move under the deep in the deeper water and they run along the bottom and then push themselves up to the top take a breath and then sink down again elephants as far as I understand it can float in fact I'm not I'm not convinced they can actually I'm not convinced an elephant can swim like say a horse can swim you hear stories of them crossing quite deep water but with their trunks out of the water and I'm not sure if they're walking on the bottom or if they're actually swimming I've now got myself a bit confused so Kathy I mean, I feel like some of those islands in Lake Kariba that the elephants go to and from, and in fact in this big in the Zambezi River, must indicate that they can swim. Because I don't, unless they do the same thing that the hippos do, just walk along the bottom and push themselves up. I'm not sure. Look at those little things having a great time. And the kingfishers having a spat still. All the action going on in that tree. The darter sitting above. There he is. What a magical evening. Now, of course, no mammal is able to breathe under the water and pan catch the respiratory system of the animal is exactly the same on water and on land they can obviously hold their breath for longer than you or I can unless you were particularly good at holding your breath I'm not and they just I'm sure they breathe pretty normally when they're on land they don't have a a different respiratory system it's still uh, used uses the lungs same. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I'm getting you correctly. Look how many little things there are. Any fun, fat little crash of toddler hippos. Trying to show how big their mouths are. They are some of the cutest animals out here. One of them just resting on his friend's back there. He's a bit tired after a strenuous weekend. Pied wagtail is the bird you... Two pied wagtails, the two birds you can see there. <laughs> Look how fat they are. Now, see, I'm sure this is not what you've asked, but it sounded like you asked if that nest was where the hippo nest in the dead tree. Now, hippos don't make nests, Marcy. I'm being facetious. I know you didn't really mean that. That nest is an old red-billed buffalo weaver's nest, Marcy. And you might just be able to hear them going... From the myriad other apartment blocks they've built around the place. That one is disused at the moment, so... I don't think... The pied wagtails nest in there. I don't. I, if I'm not mistaken, they nest in mud banks. But I'm going to check that for you because I might be telling you a lie, and that would be terrible any time, but especially on a Sunday evening. Let me have a look. See, wagtail, African pied, click click, habitat. You can hear them giving their little Sunday songs, the hippos. Oh, no, they, they breed in a cup nest, often placed over water, so they don't breed in mud. So they could easily build their little nest in that, or underneath that tree, or on top of it. Well, they probably do have a nest there. Let's check when they breed. General habits, foraging and food, breeding, monogamous. Typically retains mate for successive breeding attempts. Now, um, <laughs> we, we, we've been talking about the swimming abilities of the large grey animals and child of the universe of a rhino's swimming abilities, I'm afraid I have absolutely no idea. David, do you know if a rhino is able to swim? 
think no. I'm not 100% sure, but I would think no. I would say no as well. I think they would almost certainly sink in the same way that a hippo does. I've never seen a rhino paddling around in a water hole like this. I've definitely seen elephants cavorting around, but a rhino, no. I've seen them lying in mud, but I've never seen them try to swim, so I don't know if they're able to do the breaststroke or the butterfly. Hmm. Very gorgeous, gorgeous scene. Well, here yeah, I'm going to make a cliched link, everybody. It's becoming night time and of course therefore time to put on your pajamas well put your pajamas on it is getting late but there's another animal that uh, is like a donkey in pajamas with that swishing tail there and we're here next to Voyotella dam so you can probably see that zebra on the dam cam I don't know if you could see us at the moment. Hopefully we're camouflaged enough in the in the thickets here that you can't see us. But uh, see that zebra happily grazing away next to the dam. And the sun has gone down now. So we're getting that wonderful colours uh, in the skyline now. It's pinks and blues. It is very, very pretty. Um, and that skyline is fantastic. So we're going to start making our way back towards camp because... Uh, you know, we don't really uh, want to be walking out in the dark, but uh, I, I've had a thoroughly enjoyable walk. It's been great getting into the nitty-gritty, down with the with all the small stuff, and um, just investigating what has been going on, looking at all the tracks and signs, etc. And, well, I'm glad that you all joined us on it. It is always wonderful to be out on foot, and you should uh, take up the chance any time you get if you come to Africa, because for me it is the best way to experience the bush. And, um, well, you can just hear and feel everything so much better than on a vehicle. So we're going to make our way back towards camp. I think that's probably it for us on the, on the bushwalk. But uh, let's head you back to James. Bye for now. Now, very kindly, I got onto my, well, not very kindly on my part, but I got onto the tweeter while you were away and immediately I knew somebody would have found the answer for me. Stacy, you have found a reference that says elephants can swim. They swim completely submerged with their head above the water and their mouths below and use all four legs to paddle. So absolutely elephants can swim. Very good news indeed. Thank you very much. Can this fellow get behind us? Yeah. Can? He's not the same. Okay. <laughs> Does not have the same All right. Um, Senzo's just putting on the infrared light. This is why uh, we're not zooming into anything, and that's the uh, large finger. Sorry? Yeah, with pleasure. He looks so deeply offended, this fellow, like I've just insulted his entire family. Sometimes one is filled with an insatiable rage and the desire to scream out and um, tell somebody really what you think of them. Unfortunately, we are now live and I'm unable to do that, so I must just grin and bear it. I'm over it now. Let us go back to the hippopotami over there. Senzel? Are you able to zoom that camera anymore, or are you, or are you, you not? There we are. Good, fantastic. I turn around, I say to David, David, can he get past? David says, yes, he can definitely get past. Even a truck. Even a truck, David says, could have got past. Sorry, can you move, please? Can you move that, please? Nasty piece of work. May his dinner be infested with stink bugs this evening. Now, hippopotamus, of course, live in the water, and therefore, Cecilia, yes, I suppose you could call them aquatic animal. Uh, well, their Latin name, of course, is Hippopotamus amphibius. 
and so I suppose you'd call them amphibious mammals rather than aquatic ones. I suppose a truly aquatic mammal would be something like a dolphin or a whale or a porpoise or a seal maybe. Maybe a seal would also be considered uh, amphibious. So let's call them amphibious mammals rather than aquatic ones. Do you want to go to infrared? Is it necessary, Senzel? All right, Senzel would like to go to infrared. Oh, well, he did. thanks for the warning. There we go. Lukey, we're in infrared, if you're wondering. <laughs> we are good. Well done, Senzel. Were you getting a message there on your radio? <laughs> you can see it really does pick up a whole lot more light, doesn't it? You can almost see that young hippo's tonsils. Oh, he's eating the tree. We can see these youngsters playing around with each other and having a bit of a game and jumping on top of each other. And I think it's an interesting one, Red. I don't know if they ever try and drown each other when they're having a fight. I'm sure these little ones aren't trying to do that. I imagine they probably do, you know. But I've never read anything about that. That's a really interesting question. It would be a very quick way to kill a rival, wouldn't it? I'm not sure that they have the equipment, you know. I mean, if a human being is trying to drown another human being, they can stand and kind of hold... This is a morbid subject. Anyway, they can stand and hold their victim's head under the water, but, you know, it's difficult to see a scenario where one hippo's head would be under the water and the other one wouldn't, if you know what I mean. Unless they happen to be in the perfect kind of uh, depth of water and one managed to stand on the other's head. I'm going to say no, I don't think they'd try and drown each other. This chap is now going to spike his pallet on that tree. And just like with every single <clears throat> other mammal species, this kind of playground behavior is going to set up the dominance hierarchy that will last probably for the rest of their lives. I'm going to move on from here, see what else we can find as darkness falls. The Stivovo has not had to find anything further. And Tandy has not done too much, apart from just munch, munch, munch away at her little steenbok that is left. Tlalamba has yet to reveal her pretty face once again, and the light is fading. The African night is upon us. Did you hear a call? She made a little call there. Last time she did that, Tlalamba arrived pretty soon on the scene. It's kind of getting into that time of night when you'd want your children nearby before all the scaries come out in the night. Tunley being one of the scaries, but doesn't want to become too adventurous. You know, these little cats are very, very adventurous, and I don't know where she's gone. But I'm sure she's somewhere nearby. Probably chasing Franklins, or trying to. We haven't heard them. Here we go, let's listen. Let's see what she spotted. Ah, I can hear a Dacre alarm calling. Might have been a Steenbok. I don't actually know the difference between their alarm call. It was a little bleating sound. Did you hear that, Seb? <laughs> Definitely got her ears pricked up. We're going to stay with her, see what happens here. Yeah? Here they're the Telf. Franklin in the background. Is there in the darkness. Yeah, she's 
calling again for her cub? Doesn't seem too concerned. Definitely sounded like something up there, eh, Seb? Mm -hmm. Seb almost thought it sounded like a sneeze. Is she coming? Ah, oh, there she comes. Yeah. Just above my head. She's about to come in. There she is. There she is. Hello, gorgeous. We are in infrared, folks. That's why it's looking quite green. Well, that's infrared now. Oh, she's stalking mum. Let's see how close you can get, little one, before she spots you. Don't want to get my head in the shot, Seb. I'm crouching right down here. Hello, Tlalamba. Come and say hello. Scratch on the neck. This is too precious. It's too, too precious. Without the camera, all you can see is ears in the grass. It's a dark ear, ear a shape of, of a Garfield head, really. She can hear mum munching. Let's see what she does. She's trying to be very stealthy. Look how she's delicately putting her paws down. This is all practice for the real thing. Mum knows she's coming though, but she's trying to be very stealthy. Yeah, Dundee just called again. Laura, it is too precious indeed. Tandy's calling. She wants you to come, but she's not a very obedient young cat. As I know, a lot of the viewers have na named her Rebel. <laughs> I suppose when you're that small, that she's just so innocent. You don't know what dangers there are out there. Yeah, Tandy's moving past us now. Here comes little Tlalamba. It's a nice little full belly she's got there, Tandy, as she moves on. Here she comes. There she is. She's going to investigate what Mum has left behind. Hello, gorgeous. King Quad indeed, perfection and training, and um, she needs to learn everything from mum, who's now just moving off having a toilet break. So I, I forget to ask the question earlier about do leopards get more spots. When you look at Tlalamba there, you can see she's got plenty of spots, but the spacing between is probably just a little bit, a little bit tighter packed than mum. There she is. Hello, mum. Hello, mum. No rest for, for parents, even when they want to go to the toilet. The youngsters are always very interested. <laughs> she is too cute. Joy, I didn't notice any wound on Tani's chest. Um, she hasn't really shown herself to us too clearly, but there's no obvious sort of sign in her behaviour. She was lying on her chest earlier. She seemed to be very comfortable lying there. Oh, look at that. The youngsters having a toilet break directly where mum was. There we go. Not shy at all for the camera. Just a little mini version of mum. Okay, well, it looks like James is watching the full moon rising. We're going to stay here. Let's go over to him with his Luna. I am indeed trying to watch the full moon rising. I didn't realize it was going to be full today, but I think it is. And there seems to be a lot of gold dust spread about it, doesn't there, Senzo? 
Do you think perhaps there has been a... F oh, you mean you were in infrared, at least, yes. Now you're in colour, are you? Are we in colour there? Uh, yes, Lucas, are, are you in colour? Or are you still in black and white? Thank you very much for that information, Luke. It is apparently extremely orange where you're sitting watching it. It's quite orange where we are here. <laughs> Beautiful. And it does look like it's been sprayed about with gold dust. Perhaps some fairies have become excited by it on Sunday afternoon, evening, Sunday evening, Sunday evening. We'd planned to go back to the lions. I don't know if we're going to have another view of them, though. That's how, sort of our plan. I think they are moving, and I think they're moving quite close to the western boundary of Chitwa, which means we won't be able to follow them, but we'll, we'll give it a go and see what we come up with. All righty. We're going to go back into infrared now, Lucas. No, turns out we have to tell them before we do that. You can't just do it. Otherwise, I'm going to get it in the neck tomorrow at our morning meeting. Okay, that's that's a relief. Luke, Luke is very understanding, unlike some. I mean, some you would do that to it. We're in trouble for weeks. and you say, wow, South Africa gets to have a moon, and then you confused yourself by being surprised by this. Uh, yes, we have a moon, and in fact, uh, there's quite a nice story around this as we drive, hopefully, towards those lines. There was a great sunset once, and there was a German guest on the back of a vehicle, and they were with a number of South African guests, and South African guests were often some of the worst guests we had because they felt the need to impress everybody with the paucity of bush knowledge. And this guy said, as the sun went down, you know, as we've shown you many times, he says, take a picture, take a picture of that, or of the sun, of the sunset. It's gorgeous. Take a picture, take a picture. And eventually, this German turned him and said. We have the sun in Germany as well, you know, and it goes down there also. Which I thought was a very salient point. Now, these lions are mobile. I'm afraid, unfortunately, I think there are too many people here. Let me just try and figure out what's going on here. Let's go across to Steve while I do that. Well, first of all, Little Talamba followed her mom's uh, direction and had a little toilet break exactly where she did. And we are now parked right next to it, which is marvelous, I must say. And uh, then mom started giving her proper grooming. Oh, it's okay, Tundi. We haven't done anything. She hasn't looked at us, at us like that at all. And suddenly she just looks at us like that in the darkness with her teeth. She's having herself a bit of a groom and she was giving Talamba a bit of a, a, a lick down. And I think the youngster is, is over the grooming and wants to start moving now. She's definitely full of energy, full of beans, you would say. And I've no doubt that they'll be on the move shortly, probably in search of some water. She's actually just behind this bush, so you won't get her if you... just there in the darkness behind the bush. You won't get her. Yeah, you know, she's just sitting there. And I'm not going to move any further forward without chasing Tundi. Caitlin, African wildcats most certainly bury their dung, like normal cats, but leopards do not, lions do not, um, serval do as well, but um, I've never seen a leopard do it. I've seen leopards cover the, the carcass before, or the stomach content of something they killed with sand, but not, uh, not, not, their, not their dung. I don't know why, it's just the way it is. Why do cats, domestic cats, do it? I don't know why either. To be um, secretive, perhaps? No idea. I don't know what the purpose is. 
There she is. Hey, Mum, I want to be the star of the show. I wonder if she realises how many people absolutely love her. She's got enormous ears, almost like her, her older brother, Tumba. I wonder if she's going to grow into those ears. He still hasn't grown into his ears. Salish, I don't think so. I think she knows she raises the cubs exactly the same. Um, it's all about feeding them, keeping them safe. Um, there's no real sex to them for a long time. So um, the male obviously gets bigger than the female and requires a little bit more food later on and maybe becomes a bit more competitive with mom. Sorry about the front of my car. This is live, folks. These cats are doing what they need to do right in front of us. And I'm not going to start the car to chase away the little youngster. But um, I don't think there's any difference in how a parent will raise her cub. I think they just do what they do. I mean, for example, she's been in very similar areas, I believe, to previous litters. Am I right, Seb? Yes. Yeah, same areas, same sort of strategy. You know, feed, hoist, train them, keep them safe. She's very interested in me, eh, Seb? Mm -hmm. I think last night someone said she's got a... She's got a... <laughs> Heart, enormous ears, enormous ears. She's looking right at Seb. I think she's got a, a fetish for cameramen because last night I heard um, Brent say that she was looking at Davi. Now she's looking at Sebastian. Hmm. Also trying to figure out. They're very inquisitive, you know. She, she knows that, that we're not a threat because mum's allowed us into the space and she hasn't reacted in any way. You'll see how she keeps looking back at mum. Mum's relaxed, but this has been going on for months. That's how leopards are easily habituated when the adult is habituated because they seem to learn very quickly. Well, mum's not bothered. I'm not going to be too bothered, but they're still inquisitive. They still want to have a little sniff, have a little feel. All these weird, the plethora of smells coming off the vehicle. There's diesel, there's oil, brake fluid. Oh, there we go. I want some more licking, mum. Not done with the grooming yet. Oh, that's too precious. That's too precious. David, you want to know if staying with him after dark puts him in danger. If the cub was on its own, certainly. Um, but we we are not using any lights. We will not be using any lights at all. Um, and Tandy's here. The mother's here, so it's absolutely no problem. But, uh, yeah, we're not going to be staying for very much longer. And if they move very far, we won't be staying. Well, we still actually got, sure, over half an hour. It's so dark already. But if the cub was on her own, we would not be here at all. We would have left already. But uh, we're not attracting any attention. We're not using any lights. Yeah, she's scratching here, Seb, I think. Can you hear her? <laughs> she's here scratching somewhere. We can hear her. So you're definitely viewing cubs off the dark is a big no-no. Um, and putting a spotlight on a cub off the dark is a very big no-no. Um, even putting spotlights on, on predators, really, it's kind of being moved away from. But is her scratching was at bones? I think she's got more of the Steenbock just over there. Can we just look over here if the cub is in front of me still, Seb? Mm -hmm. And then I'll move. Okay, there's no cub over here. See, I can't see that area, folks. <laughs> it, is, it is dark, but it sounds like she's found the remainder of her Steenbock. So let's just inch, oopsie. Okay, the hyenas have just emerged into the scene here. And that would chase a cat straight up the tree. There's a hyena. That hyena is going to take the kill. There it is. And it'll be very silent about it. Won't tell anybody. See, that hyena came out of nowhere, but it would have known she was here this morning. But it has not caught any of the cats. It has only caught the remainder of whatever Tundi was munching on. I'm just going to move around the corner here. I heard them move off. The hyena just moved off. Yeah. I heard the hyena run.
Aina is in front of my car now, trying to figure out where these leopards have gone. Yes. Oh boy, no, no, no. This is part and parcel of what happens out here, folks. That's why it's probably good to just have the vehicle off and listen. I have no doubt that the leopards are safe. The hyena is moving around. It's moving to the last tree it was at, where the remains of the steenbuck are. Very good chance that the cat's bolted off or climbed a tree, but we haven't quite spotted them yet. We don't want to disturb the scene. Rather let them all be safe. Not much left for you there, young hyena lass. Apparently a lot of the viewers can identify these guys. I wouldn't know how to identify a hyena. Okay, well, I'm just going to go forward, yeah? Okay, I don't know where they're gone. I heard, as Seb mentioned, the hyenas are coming in. The, the leopards bolted off and I thought they bolted straight for this tree up ahead here, but we will see. Amazing, amazing, a vanishing act. Just like that, they disappeared, but I'm sure they are here somewhere. They might have even just walked away. And in moments, leopards vanish into the darkness. Okay, well, while we search for these beautiful cats, let's go back over to James with his boot. I'm just waiting, everyone, for a little space to open up in the lion sighting. They did get moving towards the west, so I didn't think we'd be able to see them, but they're now not moving. There are three people there already, and they've said that I can come when one of them leaves, and that means you can come with me. Very exciting. Temperature's dropping slowly. It's probably now about... 72 degrees or so Fahrenheit so it's not exactly freezing but certainly winter is on the way we're also in the vicinity where Hoshana was yesterday oh whoops daisies well, Paula, that nearly answered your question for you. It was almost never. Um, <laughs> you want to know when we're going to get, you're going to get to meet David? I'm hoping around about the 2nd of May. I shall unleash him on you. Oh, here we go. Hang on a second, everybody. Go ahead. Colby, thanks. I'll make my way. All righty, we're on our way. All right, goody, Steve has been successful. Yes, well, she, she just went straight up the tree she was originally in with the Steenbock, but we're just listening out. She's called twice for the cub, and the cub has not materialized. But it probably slunk away and is hiding. The hyena has been too busy with the remains of that steenbok to have noticed the cub. So don't worry, folks. The cub's instinct is to, to hide away or climb up a tree. Sorry about that. She is listening. There we go, she's calling. This is 100% live. We cannot predict what will happen next.
Alicia, yeah, the cub and mom were grooming and the hyena came out of nowhere and mum just launched herself into the tree and I don't know what there's another hyena coming in here from the right so hyena right underneath her there listen to her hissing at it this is incredible folks I don't know if it's a different hyena or it's the same one so walk around sniffing. Yes, Tandy. This is incredible, folks. You can almost see the concern on her face, though. I have a very strong feeling the cub is perfectly fine. It's just being very quiet. It wouldn't come to her now if she called, obviously because there are hyenas lurking around so wherever it is it's secreted away and once the hyenas lose interest from the smell and the bones that they've eaten they will move off in search of another scrap or meal somewhere else Oh, Luke, I don't see the hyena anymore. I think that little piece we saw there is about as action riddled as it might be. Now it's the waiting game. Just bear in mind, folks, that this happens probably every night to these cats. That's why they live in trees, spend a lot of their time in trees, to, to be safe from the marauding hyenas. I mean, she's only half a meter or a meter off the ground. She's, <laughs> she's actually, that's the ground just there, probably about a foot from below her foot. So she's not very well protected from the hyena, but she's very quick might have seen that clip on Saturday of Hosanna climbing that tree ridiculously fast up a tree okay I'm um, Kathy I'm gonna answer your question I'm just gonna move forward a meter so that you can get her face just in a little bit of a hole. Kathy, you can't wrap your head around why a leopard is scared of a hyena. Well, a hyena has a, the most powerful bite for an animal of its size, and if a hyena happened to bite Tundi on her leg, or anywhere really, it might not kill her, but it would definitely cripple her ability to hunt and climb a tree, which is basically a death sentence. So any leopard on encountering anything, hyena's calling in the background, on encountering anything like a hyena. Okay, well, we'll carry on with what I'm talking about in, in moments, but let's go to James, who's found his lions. Well, you were all asking if these lions are calling at the moment, and they have started to call. This one here is just making sort of perfunctory, uh, perfunctory, Rules. Here you go.
Well, there's your answer, everybody. The Evoker boys are here to stay. There is no clearer announcement of a male lion claiming a territory than that. That's two of them. We don't know where the third one is. Was that not spectacular? Now, we're not going to be able to stay here long. There are quite a few people trying to get into the sighting, obviously because now these lions are calling, which means that, you know, if you ever visit Africa, of course, it's the one thing your guide really wants to show you. So we'll sit here another few minutes and just see if we don't get lucky with another call. I'm just going to ask on the radio how many standbys there are. How many stations on standby for this Avoca mail sighting? I'm just trying to find out how many on standby. Can't hear that. Sorry, just go again with that, I can't hear. Okay, copy, thanks. Um, just give me another three minutes here and I'll pull out. Oh, now, what these other guys are doing is going around to see if they can't find the other one. So I don't think we're in any tearing rush to leave. We'll hang around for a few minutes. Also, we did get here last. So we don't need to leave just yet because they're looking for the third one. Now, I didn't hear, but apparently he was also calling. Now, that's a pretty loud sound, and if you're sitting next to it, it can really rattle your rib cage. That's the big sort of um, uh, analogy that everyone gives. Jason, it can probably be heard by a lion up to, I'd say, 10 to 15 kilometers as the crow flies. Uh, maybe not quite that far. Let's call it 10 kilometers as the crow flies. Human being, I think you'll hear them on a cool morning. Yeah, I think you'll easily hear them from about 5 kilometers or so. Maybe even further than that, in fact. Let's say 5 to 10 kilometers for a human being, 10 to 15 for a lion. Obviously, their ears are a lot more sensitive than ours are. All right, this is good news. It looks like we can stay. These guys are leaving. And as they leave, uh, the, there are another two groups looking for the other lion. So we can just stay here. Hello. Let me move forward for you, everybody. Sorry. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I missed that. Lucas, can we have it again? Is that alright, Sins? Now, that calling, as I was saying, Johnson is an advertisement to say, this is our territory, we're taking over here. And it's in a, just to basically say to all the other lions in the area, this is ours. And you'll find lions throughout the night in the various territories of the Kruger National Park will be doing exactly what these three have done. But younger than this, you will find that they will not be calling. They won't call because they want to stay under the radar. These guys have now broken cover and said, OK, if anybody thinks this land is theirs, then they must come and challenge us for it because we are laying down the challenge. We may just have witnessed the passing of the age of the Birmingham boys over here. Uh, not so much with an enormous fight and a scratch and a bite, but uh, with a little bit of a, well, I wouldn't say whimper, but the Birminghams have just moved on. These guys have come into an unoccupied territory and find themselves with great luck. We'll give them a chance to call once more and then we can move out. And 
what is so fascinating is that we, there's been a lot of research done on lion voices and whether or not individual lions can be recognized by other lions. And Pixel, no question about it, the Nguhumas and the Styx prides will not recognize these as Birmingham males. They will know that they are not Birmingham males, that they are not the same. just see if they call again and I know you can probably hear a lot of uh, radio noise that's not on our vehicle that's on the other two vehicles just fantastic stuff to hear that sound I'd, it's been a very long time since I've heard that especially at that proximity and so exciting to be around here for this takeover or shall we say replacement? I think takeover would be a strong term. All right, I believe that uh, Steve has got good news. Yes, we do. Looks like Kalamba has made it back to the tree, and she's not giving Mummy some well-needed attention. Hey, Mum. Smile for the camera. Take your screenshots now. <laughs> so she just materialized again out of the darkness. She came into the tree. She gave mum a little sniff. Thought about going higher up into the tree. And then thought better of it. And thought, nope, let's continue the grooming. Who doesn't like head scratches? Well, I do. <laughs> Isn't that just too precious? Now what, bum? Yes, Kathy, uh, to get back onto that, if a leopard gets bitten by a hyena, it's over for them, really. So they'd rather avoid it. Rather avoid it. Um, hyenas are very tough, resilient characters. And um, if, but they've got such powerful bites. You know, a, a leopard attacking a hyena probably might not kill it because hyenas are very tough. But one bite from a hyena and the leopard, the ability to climb, is is over. So that is the reason. It's an evolutionary adaptation to to move away and then come back. I've seen. Uh, Leopards kill things and then hyenas emerge on the scene and the leopard leaves immediately. He assesses what's going on and then comes back. I've seen often male leopards come back and chase the hyena off the kill. But the reason they move is they don't have time to contemplate who it is that's running in from the darkness. It could be lions, it could be another leopard, it could be a clan of hyena. So essentially they have to move off, reassess the situation and then come back. But for a female leopard to take on hyena, it's just not worth the risk. So I hope that answers your question, Kathy. I think one on one in a fight, a hyena's got just such a powerful bite. Well, Clifford, we were sitting here. We could hear those Avoca males calling from Chitwa Dam. Um, we could hear them, and she just lay there very nonchalant, very non caring. So, I don't, th we were wondering, Seb and I were talking, like, what do you think they do? What do leopards do? And uh, she did absolutely nothing. She just lay there. So, I suppose that the purpose of the calling at least lets you know where they are, and she'll know how far away they are, and it won't be concerned to her. That's the animal you don't hear calling, that's the concern, because you don't know where they are. But when they advertise themselves, it's a very obvious sort of beacon for where they are, and other lions... We'll see it with, with the females. The Ukuhuma pride will be hearing them call, and they'll get up and move in the opposite direction. Hopefully that's not further south from where they were. Maybe they'll push them up here in to Juma, who we'll probably see in the next few days. I've been sitting with prides of lions, and a male's called in the north or the south, and the lions get up and they walk in the opposite direction. I've seen that many, many times. 
But a leopard doesn't have anything to really fear of the male lions, apart from if they do interact. Uh, lions aren't looking to seek out the leopards for mating or for any purpose like that for territory. So the, fe the leopards will just avoid them as much as they can. They're no match for a lion, no match for a male lion at all. And it's in this exact area that um, the Birmingham, one of the Birmingham boys actually climbed up a marula tree earlier this year and stole two of Tundi's kills that she left in the tree. That was the... Oh, there we go. It looked like she was doing some scent marking there, sir. Hey, she's trying to be mum. Her little wiry tail. That's probably in response to the fact that there were hyena out there. The youngsters kind of moved onto the spot where the hyena were and did a little bit of like a territorial scrape. No, Linda, don't go anywhere. We don't have too many minutes left of the show. And we're going to see if we can keep up with these two. I can't even see them. Seb's got them on the camera when I'm looking. Okay, should we move up there? Okay, we're going to move up so that we don't lose them in the darkness. Stay with us, though, folks. There are some big termite mounds in and around here, so bear with us if we suddenly disappear down a hole. Okay, while well, we try and reposition for these two. Oh, there she is in the tree. Have you got it? Sorry. Sorry. She climbed up a tree and now she's down. Tundi's just right here there. on the left. There she is. Okay. There she is, just in the long grass. Licking her lips. What direction are you two going to go? Towards Gwari Pan, perhaps? For some light drinking? This is when it really gets fun, trying to follow them in this at night. <laughs> Seb laughs under his breath. He knows how hard it is, but we will attempt the impossible. Okay, so we can try to stay up with them here. Seems like James has managed to refine some signal. So while we try and keep up with these two, let's go back over to him. What we're trying to do is find the third evoker male. We heard him calling in here. He set the proverbial lion amongst the impala. There he is. Is that him? No, that's a log. Never mind. He's somewhere here. We must have driven straight past him. I've driven this road already today. He was so flat, deep in the grass. Anyway, he was yelling just in here. There's a small and frightened scrub hare. Now, he could be moving, or he could be sort of trying to get the others to come towards him. I would have said he was right here. Oh, there's a noise. Is that him? And I'm sure many of you, rather like me, most impressed by your first sighting or sounding of an evoker male roar. Most impressive it was. Especially given that they're not the biggest fellows yet. Yeah, I can see a whole lot of vehicle activity and I wonder, this is obviously where they found the third one this morning. So he's around here somewhere, yelling his head off. He's not yelling at the moment, I'll switch off. There he is. We got him. We got the third one. Hooray! Let me just turn the car. 
Hello, my friend. We'll turn off the lights. We'll look at you in infrared. Don't worry. What you got in there? There we are. So he's about, I'd say about, whew, how far do we think away would we say the others are? Probably about 400 meters, quarter of a mile. Now I'd be very interested to know if any of you think this one is slightly larger or slightly smaller than the other two. Because what I think is quite interesting is that there's definitely a split in this coalition already. There are the two of them and then this guy on his own. And when we saw them on foot it was two together, the other guy was away. And I wonder if he isn't slightly older. It looks to me like his mane extends slightly further down his back. And I wonder if he perhaps comes from a different... Well, it would mean he probably comes from a different mother. Maybe the other two are litter mates. And this guy's a cousin. He's looking a bit forlorn at the moment, but he gave a wonderful call. Let's see if he goes again. And I just must, I mean, I just said the same thing as Murphy's asked. I said I wondered if he was the leader, and then I realised, of course, that's not a, it's not really what happens um, in these coalitions. There's no real leader at all. They just kind of go about their business, and there's no obvious dominant. Well, in theory, that's what the textbooks will tell you, or certainly some textbooks. But when I think back to the Matimba males, who were the group before the Birminghams. One was definitely bigger than the other and he seemed to monopolize the mating opportunities. So to say that he wasn't the dominant or, you know, more uh, more dominant male, I think would be wrong. But whether he was the leader or not and he made the decisions, I don't know. A big yawn. And just listening for the others, perhaps wondering if the Avoca males are calling or not. And not the Avoca males, the Birminghams. And Chris, I don't, it really depends where the Birminghams are, whether they could hear him or not. I'm not going to try and follow him through this thicket, everybody. I believe that Stivovo has managed to get himself stuck in a hole. So you're going to stay with us for now. OK, well, I think that was a great lion sighting. We started off very weakly with that uh, rather pathetic uh, sleeping sighting we had and ended very strongly. I'm sorry we didn't get him calling. And one of the things that made the Majingalan coalition so very strong was the fact that they seemed to come together every time there was trouble. Now that's unusual. And Sammy Jane, you say, will they split? They could easily split, yes. But a coalition of three is a small coalition. So, in a coalition of four, to find two and two together, which again the Matimbas did, they were four, and then they were two and two, it's not unusual to find them splitting. But I think in a coalition of three, I really don't think that's going to happen. I think it's much more likely that they will stay together. All right, we might, no, we won't have a dodgy signal, we should be fine over here. Now remember, we are having a time change. It's not tomorrow, it's the day after, I think, isn't it? Because today is the 29th, unless I've gone mad. Correct, Luke? Okay, good. So the time change will occur on Tuesday morning. We will move one half hour later to escape the darkness in the morning and one half hour earlier in the afternoon. So we'll be going live at 6.30.
Central African time in the morning and then again at 3 o'clock Central African time in the afternoon. So that is how the changes will occur. A couple of birds knocking about here, some water thick knees and we're going to shine on them. We'll give you a last look at Chitwa Lodge and the moon. Gorgeous stuff. All right, everybody. That's going to be it from us today. A marvellous, marvellous afternoon we've had of cats. A marvellous weekend. And most encouragingly, my Monday morning will be spent doing exactly what all my other mornings are doing. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been an absolute joy having you with us. I'm not sure what Senzo's doing. Until tomorrow morning, stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world.